Good evening, all, and welcome. The Mortis Media app is finally out for people on Android and for everyone else on Apple. It will be out very soon. This is what it looks like. You can select the type of story you want, select the story itself, adjust the parameters within the app, and finally, play around with the background music and sound effects. You know, level them, layer them, Do, play all the sound effects you want, rain in this case, or any others that you want to throw in, you can do that. It's a lot of fun, and I would really, really appreciate it if you guys could download it, give me your honest feedback, and leave a review and a star rating. That's all I'm asking, and it would mean the absolute world to me. Tonight, we're going to listen to how it would sound like on the app, with a selection of stories and, of course, some nice rain background to keep us busy. But for now, it's time to get comfortable. Don't forget to download and leave that review, and let the darkness take control. I am a female in my late twenties. My parents, a charming lesbian couple, owned a funeral home and cemetery in a village on the outskirts of the Alaskan tundra. It was a small business that had been passed down from my grandmother Agatha's father, who inherited it from his father and so on. Katie, my other mother, was terrified of the whole situation from the beginning. She was positive that someone would get possessed with us living so close to a field of corpses, in her words. Over time, exactly eight years after they moved there, she grew to respect the land, as well as the tenants resting in peace there. I was born shortly after her change of heart but she still limited my access to the cemetery. And while no one was ever possessed, we still had our fair share of terrifying experiences at our home and throughout the property. I went to a tiny schoolhouse every weekday from the time I could walk. Only 13 or so children lived in our town, so we were all educated in one room by a small group of teachers. Katie and her twin sister Gloria were two of these teachers. The three of us would walk to and from town every day, while Arga and her brother Cal took care of the property. It was a 20 minute trek, but on the occasional day without freezes, we got to take our bikes, and that was generally the highlight of my life. However, on this particular day in December, we had to walk. We were only at the school until about four o'clock that afternoon, but the sun usually set around 3.30, so we were shrouded mostly in darkness by the time we got up to the dirt road leading up to our property. I was about six or seven at the time, and still used my clumsiness as an excuse not to walk up the path muddied by snow. Glory had drawn the short straw and was giving me a piggyback ride up the hill. I was resting my head against her back and staring at the cemetery that was beginning to come into view around the paper birches and spruce trees. It was a sprawling field filled with an odd assortment of mausoleums, colourful tombs of Inuit and the Russian Orthodox citizens and I was always entranced by the graves, and tried to pick out the ones that I had yet to see. We were nearly to the house, when I saw a figure standing in the far right corner of the cemetery. It was hard to discern their age or gender, but I could tell from the build that it wasn't Arga or Cal. Visiting hours ended at sundown regardless of the date, so I immediately pointed the person out to Katie. Most of the finer details are recalled by my parents and older family members, due to my young age throughout most of these events. But I can still clearly remember hearing Katie mutter, shit, quietly under her breath. She helped me off Glory's back, and ordered that I go inside to tell Cal to meet them in the field. Without hesitation, I suddenly found myself as sure-footed as a bunny on the icy ground, and sprinted the last twenty or so yards up to the house. I swung the door open, 
and went into the kitchen where I knew I'd find Aga and Cal, and told my uncle to get the trespasser. Groaning, Cal finished his cup of coffee, which was probably spiked with whiskey, and stood from the table. Angak Cal was a big guy, about six foot eight, with broad shoulders, and what I called Fred Flintstone fists. Basically, he could knock someone out without much effort. And he did so time and time again. He was insanely protective of his sisters, and all of the other women in his life, Glory and Katie included. The entire town respected him and feared him at the same time. He was a nice home security system. Naturally, I was thrilled with this tiny bit of excitement in my normally humdrum life. When my uncle charged out the back without so much as a coat on, I turned my pleading eyes to Aga, who barely flinched at the activity. She stared back at me for only a moment, before sighing and motioning to the rack by the door. I grabbed her parka, and helped her put it on as we made our way outside. Knowing that her wife was going to be none too thrilled with my presence in the cemetery, Arga picked me up when we reached the cast iron fence that surrounded the property. We could see Cal's giant silhouette approaching the tiny ones of Katie and Glory. The stranger was still a good 100 or so yards from us. Let's hide and watch, I whispered to Arga when I realized that Katie hadn't spotted us yet. For a moment, I thought my mother would shake her head and go to the others. But she surprised me by giving me a conspiring smile and ducked behind a mausoleum. We can get to grandmother's grave if we're very quiet, she told me with a glint in her eye. She loved the graveyard and had spent her childhood playing in it while also learning about her ancestors and the people of her town. She wanted me to enjoy it as much as she did. We hurried from grave to grave, pausing only long enough to make sure the others didn't see us. Katie, Glory and Cal were moving swiftly as well, but they were too busy eyeing the figure, standing only about 20 feet from the large tomb that encased my great grandmother our destination. When we arrived at the tomb, Aga set me down, and we crouched behind the rocks and wood that surrounded Grandmother's altar. It was then that I began to feel nerves eat away at my gut. This was a stranger, I could tell. They were standing at the base of the mausoleum, built to honour the infants who had passed before being blessed by the tribe's shaman. This was an old outdated site that didn't fully honour Inuit customs, though it had been redone in the 1970s, closer to the northern section of the property. No one came to this site because it would be considered disrespectful to their deceased, but it would have just been as disrespectful to tear it down. So it was just a derelict memorial that loomed on the tiny hilltop of that section of the cemetery. Tension filled the air as Cal, flanked by Katie and Glory, approached the stranger. I could hear my uncle speaking to them, likely telling them our hours, and asking them if they'd like a ride back into town. He always started off nice, giving people the benefit of the doubt before going into Hulk mode. Arga, who had initially been giggling at the sight of her brother looming over the trespasser, was beginning to cling tighter to me as time went by. It took us a few minutes to realize that the person hadn't been responding to Cal, nor had they even looked his way. They continued to stare at the area just above the mausoleum. Katie and Gloria were exchanging uneasy glances at one point, and Cal told them to go back to the house they refused, and stepped closer to his side. When words failed, Cal resorted to the physical approach, 
He later recalled that he could tell the person was an old man, and that they were frail, and that he didn't want to hurt them. But he wasn't listening. And if he was deaf, he'd have to get his attention somehow. My uncle placed a gentle hand on the gentleman's shoulder. And immediately he felt a wave of nausea overcome him. He hunched over, clutching his abdomen, and cried out. Aga ordered me to stay put before darting off out from behind the stones and over to her brother who waved to her and the other women to make them leave. He insisted they go inside, but they were all frozen in place. The strange man still hadn't moved. So Katie yelled at him once more. She stepped around in front of him and waved a hand in his face. You need to leave. I'd heard her command. You can't be here after dark. It's not safe. No, it's not. The stranger finally said. He lowered his eyes to meet at my mother. Are you all right, dear? He spoke so casually to her. She stood there in shock for a good moment. She looked back at Cal, who was on his knees at this point. While she was distracted, the man turned and headed towards the exit. When he was coming towards my hiding spot, I had every intention of getting up and running away, but I was frozen in place. It felt like my body was being held down by weights, and I was sinking into the earth. I whimpered and buried my face in my arms, praying to God and my great grandmother for safety. The ice and leaves crunched in my ears, and I knew Arga realized my predicament and said something to the others, because I could hear Katie shouting at her. Finally summoning the courage, I looked up to see the man walking right by me. He didn't so much as look my way, but as he passed, he said, Good night, blue eyes, in a dulcet whisper. Immediately, I relaxed and climbed to my feet. I watched him practically float out of the cemetery and towards the road. Katie came and got me telling me we had to take my uncle to the hospital. As it turns out, Cal had to go in for some emergency surgery because his appendix had ruptured. He's convinced that the old man somehow cursed him on contact. Even Arga, sweet but superstitious Arga, had her doubts about his claim. There was nothing malicious in Cal's approach to the man. Why would he have cursed him? This wasn't the last time we saw this strange man. We actually saw him two or three more times in the following weeks. He was always at the derelict infant's mausoleum, staring up at the sky. He never spoke or bothered anyone. And from that point on, he always came while it was light out. I would sometimes sneak out and watch him from my grandmother's grave. He was a white man, which struck a chord with me. It was my theory that he was Katie and Gloria's real father, who had abandoned them when they were still very young. Katie quickly disproved this theory, telling me that their father died in the early 90s. But that meant nothing to me. It could still be him. The last time I saw him was in early February the following year. It was snowing heavily, and I was helping Aga and Cal go about and check to see if all the tombs and mausoleums were closed. Sometimes family members of the deceased would perform rituals on their newly departed, placing ceremonial offerings on their bodies, but they weren't always restored to their tombs to the way they were. We did our best to ensure that none of the graves would be flooded come the next thaw. When we approached grandmother's grave, I heard Arga sigh airily, but continued on. Immediately, I looked to the old mausoleum and smiled to the back of the old man. Good morning, I called out to him. There's no such thing, blue eyes. I heard him respond this over the wind. 
I began to laugh because it sounded like something Gloria would say after a night of drinking. But suddenly I felt a ball of sadness coil up in my stomach. I began crying and looked up at Arga with a sorrowful pout. It was the first time I had really ever felt dread and it nearly brought me to my knees. Arga picked me up and took me inside where I instantly felt better. The man was never seen on the property again. I was a little sad about it, but the adults were glad. They didn't like the pull that he had on us. It was New Year's Eve, and myself and two of my friends were out the front of my house listening to music on my iPod. We were about 12 at the time, and there was no one else around. It was probably 1030 at night, and we were waiting for the illegal fireworks to light up down the street, as this happened every year. It probably sounds a little weird. 12 year old kids alone at 10.30pm listening to Katy Perry in the middle of the street, but it wasn't too unusual. See, my neighborhood is very close. We know the neighbors really well, so our parents, who were in the house, and ourselves weren't all that concerned. We were listening to Hot and Cold by Katy Perry, and we were jamming along to it when we began to hear a whistle. First off, it sounded like it was part of the song, so I initially ignored it, but that was until it started to distort and go out of the rhythm. It didn't seem to be in tune with the song, and it was eerily out of pitch. I don't know why, maybe to hear it better, but my friend decided to pause the music. As soon as the music stopped, the whistling persisted, pitchy and slow. We were a little bit spooked, it was dark outside. Other than the few street lights on the road, we couldn't really see much or make much out of the darkness, other than the strange whistling. We were able to pinpoint the direction it was coming from soon enough though. We turned towards it and froze. About 10 meters from where we stood, just on the edge of the street lamp's light, was a man. He looked disheveled, likely homeless, and was standing there looking at us, whistling that pitchy whistle. We were all frozen for a while and caught off guard, until my fight or flight kicked in. I yelled at my friends to get inside, and they began to scream and run up the driveway. I pushed and shoved them forward, terrified because I didn't know whether they could hear what I was hearing. But the whistling had finally stopped, but something else was drowning out the silence. Heavy footsteps settled. He was chasing after us. I screamed bloody murder, opened the front door, and shoving them inside, not caring if I hurt them, I turned to slam the deadbolt on as he reached the screen door. I watched his figure come into view. He was dirty, wearing soiled long sleeved clothes and had an unkept beard and wore a torn beanie. As I closed the door, he stopped just ahead of the screen, looked at me dead in the eyes and murmured something that still makes my skin crawl. Damn it. One of my friends consoled the other who was now in tears and I watched him through the peephole. He lingered for a second more, then disappeared into the blackness. I remember my friend grabbing me and asking me if I was okay, and then pointed down to my hands. I was shaking like a leaf. We never told our parents. When I was still a baby, my Aunt Dawn's friend Eddie came to work for us. He didn't have any qualifications other than being strong and willing to work around dead people. So he was hired. Eddie was a bit weird. And according to Arga, he had a super obvious crush on Dawn. Dawn, the sweetest summer child, didn't think anything of it. She insisted that he was just a shy kid who didn't know how to talk to people, let alone girls. With her being the prettiest girl in her class, 
she took it upon herself to befriend the older teens. She was only about 15 when this all happened, and Eddie was 17. This event does not involve any violence against my aunt. I want to make it clear. Now, a little something about the property. It is an absolute treasure trove of eclectic tombs and mausoleums. But there are also dens and caves close to the woods, where nature has been left alone. While there aren't really any animals that use these dwellings, we still leave the spaces be, so that they are there during blizzard season. On the morning that Eddie started, Katie found him taking a nap in one of these dens. He hadn't even been there an hour. A few hours later, he came inside and asked for a snack. Though he hadn't done much work, Katie made him a sandwich, and when he'd finished eating it, she requested that he go into the funeral parlour and help Arga with inventory. He nodded, and hurried into the doors that led to the parlour. When Arga came in less than ten minutes later, Katie asked how what he was doing. Arga seemed confused, and when Katie told them what she asked the kid to do, she said that he'd never come in. The two of them went looking for him, and they found him sleeping in one of the empty caskets in the showroom. Fed up, and slightly concerned, my parents asked if he'd gotten enough sleep the night before, and offered him the guest room for the rest of the day, and he could finish his chores the next day if need be. Eddie apologised, and declined their offer. It's just a hangover. I'm okay now, he admitted, with his blank face and monotone voice. With that, he got to work. He helped Arga with the rest of the inventory, repaired the bulldozer, and even repainted the front gate of the cemetery. He was a model employee by dinner time. Dawn made him some stew, and brought it out to him. I had been a pill all afternoon, crying and screaming because of an earache, and my mothers didn't want to subject anyone outside of the family to the horror. A few minutes after she'd left, Dawn came back in to get Arga. She said she could hear Eddie screaming, but couldn't find him. The two sisters went out, and sure enough, there was no peace to be found inside or outside that evening. They tracked Eddie's shouts to the cemetery. That was the easy part. The graveyard was pretty big, and sound travelled funny there. Some places echoed, in other parts, the sound was muffled. Poor Paul, my grandfather, always told me that the restless spirits in the quieter places and that sound didn't travel much, as they needed a little extra peace until they found themselves. Eddie was probably pissing off a lot of spirits that day, because he was practically shrieking. Arga and Dawn split up first, searching the dens where Katie had seen him that morning, and then spreading throughout the actual tombs. After nearly 20 minutes, Dawn called for Arga to come over, to one of the covered plots near the fence. It was covered because there was to be a burial there the following day. They didn't dig too far normally, due to the ground almost being frozen, but they still had to clear three or four feet to make room for the base of the tombs. My uncle Cow had dug the plot a few days earlier, and he was going to come over the next day to help Eddie set up the rest of the site. Eddie was lying inside the shallow hole, holding his mangled knee to his chest, and screaming Dawn was staring down at him, at a loss. She was small, and couldn't help this big guy if he wasn't fully coherent. Arga was equally stunned at first, but as soon as she saw the scratches on the kid's face, she assumed it was some sort of animal attack. Climbing into the hole next to Eddie, Arga turned him on his back so that she could fully examine him. But as soon as he was facing up, he began screaming about the sun hurting his eyes, and started scratching at his face. Arga and Dawn tried to calm him down, 
but when they failed, Dawn ran to get Cal from the house. He was much bigger than Eddie, and could easily overpower him if need be. When he arrived, he sent his sisters inside. He asked them to call the town doctor, and inform him that he was bringing Eddie in immediately. They watched Cal load Eddie into the truck, and sped off down the road towards town. It wasn't until earlier the next morning that they got any kind of answer as to what happened. Eddie was a babbling mess, speaking in mostly broken Inupiaq. When he finally strung together a proper sentence, he began describing a giant hairless canine beast that attacked him when his back was turned. He said that it bit into his shoulder and transformed him into a wolf. Cal, who was very superstitious, believes that Eddie was attacked by a Kikron, an Inuit version of the Hellhound. Only it looks like a super-sized baby ferret with fangs. It has never been told that a Quirkron's bite can mutate a human, but Eddie did in fact have what looked to be a pretty nasty bite on his right shoulder. The doctor said it appeared to be a dog bite, and it was super infected. Rabies weren't really an issue in our neck of the woods, but Eddie was still quarantined, and we steered clear of stray dogs for a while after the whole ordeal. Eddie never recovered mentally, not that he was stable to begin with. He was constantly trying to tear off his own skin and bite the necks of those who tried to help. Luckily, no one was seriously injured by him. But most sadly, Eddie ultimately ended up taking his own life two years later. He slit his wrists with a sterling silver knife that his mother had gotten him from her shaman. They believed that it was the only way to rid him of the beast that possessed him. It's New Year's Eve, and after a wild night of kisses and body shots, I'm outright dead. I crawled into my buddy's bed alone at about 2am, and had the greatest 20 minute sleep of my life. I wake up to the sound of a constant thumping and cracking noise. Every other second I hear a thump, then silence. I slowly get out of his bed and creep across the bedroom. The plan was that only him and I would be staying over. And although I found a few various people nestled on couches, the bathtub, or just motionless on the floor, nothing was out of place. I couldn't find the source of the constant drumming, until I was in his basement at ground level, and facing the corner of the room. My hand touched the wall's corner, still hearing constant thumping from the other side. It was coming from the inside of the wall. I stood back maybe a few inches and just stared. That's when the tip of an axe breaks clean through the wall. I screamed out and heard my friend rushing down the stairs. I'm frozen in panic against the opposite wall when he blew through the door. He sees the axe wiggling back through the wall, then crashing again through it, sending splinters across the floor. He grabs a shovel, and we fly out the back door, turning the corner of the house to confront the axe-wielding psycho. What we found was an axe stuck firmly into the side of the house, with nobody around. We did a few laps of his house, and found no traces of the mysterious midnight lumberjack. Freakiest thing I've ever experienced. The axe lodged in the side of the house now sits in his basement, in a closed footlocker, waiting for its owner to come back and claim it. When I was about 16, my cousins Lena and Vincent were visiting from New Mexico. They are both a few years older than me, but we got along really well. I'm the youngest of all the grandkids on Katie's side, and the only grandkid on Arga's, so I always looked forward to seeing these two. They were staying with us a few days over the summer. They were both in college by that point, and they wanted to have some time away from the heat before they went back to their rigorous schedules 
Their dad, Katie's brother Max, was there as well. He was a paleontologist and was intending to do some digging in the tundra while he was there. Around the second week of their stay, Katie and Gloria went with Max to his site, leaving Arga to entertain us young'uns. She was feeling a bit under the weather, so she requested that the three of us go out and do some of the maintenance she had been working on in the cemetery. Weeds aren't much of an issue here, but grass, flowers and other plants die when the weather is so inconsistent. Every June and July, we would go to all of the grave sites and clean them up. I'd been relieved of my duties because my cousins were in town, but Arga didn't want it getting backed up. Plus, she'd promised to drive us into the city to next day and treat us to dinner and a movie if we helped. Vincent was surprisingly squeamish about the cemetery. He kept asking me why the tombs were so easy to open and freaking out about the possibility of something jumping out at him. It got to the point where Lena and I couldn't take it anymore and asked him to go sit on one of the concrete benches that lined the fence. As he was going over, he let out a groan and covered his nose. What the hell is that smell? He shouted. There was an unspoken rule in my family that we were to never speak of hell or demons within the gates of the cemetery. So I immediately shushed my cousin and asked him to say a prayer aloud to ask for forgiveness. But he ignored me and pointed at one of the tombs. Why is that one broken? He demanded. I went over to see what he was talking about and was startled to realize that one of our newer tombs, the one belonging to the village shaman's late mother, had a large crack down the middle. It looked like it had been sloppily broken and reassembled. The intense smell coming from it suggested the body was well into the decomposition process. For some idiotic reason, I pulled my shirt over my nose and crouched down to further inspect the grave. I shifted some of the smaller pieces of stone to the side and peered into the hole I'd made. Of course, the first thing I saw was the old woman's rotten hand. She had died two months before at the age of 102, and her skin had been like tissue paper. So her bones were already visible beneath the remaining tissue. The rest of the body was connected, and everything that had been buried seemed to be there. When the initial shock from seeing a deteriorated corpse wore off, I did notice something rather shocking. The body was positioned with the head towards north. In Inuit culture, only men are buried with their heads facing north. Females were buried facing the south, because they got cold easily. We never would have mixed this up, and even if we had, many people would come to view the body for days before it was finally laid to rest. Someone would have said something, that she had been positioned wrong. This revelation is what truly sent me into panic mode. Someone came in and not only desecrated a grave, which is twisted no matter which culture or belief system you're from, but they also rearranged the body in a way that could affect their spirit negatively. This woman could now be suffering in the land of souls. I ran inside without a word to my cousin. Arga knew what to do about this. She used to tell me stories of grave robbers from her childhood. These were fishermen from a town over, and their goal was to steal the jewelry and pelts our dead had been buried in. When I finally woke my mother from her NyQuil coma, she pulled on her jacket and followed me outside to the vandalized grave. Vincent was standing just outside of the cemetery now, his face white as a sheet. He obviously hadn't told Lena about our discovery, because she was on the other side of the yard plucking dead flowers out of the ground. Argy yelled at her to come and take her brother inside. When Lena waltzed over to us, she noticed Vincent was shaking and taunted him in a high-pitched voice. Ooh, little buddy, did you see a ghost? Arga shoved him towards the house and demanded that he pray for forgiveness. 
She then asked Lena to call the police in the next city over. Matters such as this had to be dealt with by a higher authority than the ones our town had to offer. Surprisingly, Arga allowed me to stay behind and help her examine it. I chalked this up to her being drunk on NyQuil. She was just stunned with the state of the grave and the body inside. Her experience prior to this had been in greedy white men who wanted quality ivory and labradite jewellery. For some reason, that was easier to accept than someone deliberately dooming the spirits of those who were laid to rest. The police came along with the shaman of the next village over. The one in our town was unable to perform a proper ceremony due to his relationship with the deceased. We have all been assured the woman's spirit is at peace now. There were no suspects as to who desecrated the grave, and it never happened again. So the police didn't really follow up with us after that. As you can imagine, my cousins refused to go into the cemetery after that. My close girlfriends and I went for a few days to my country home during a New Year's. We were 17, five in total, and the house is 125 years old and is located on the main road of a small town. The backyard is huge. The way to enter the lot is through three front doors, one hard to climb front gate the gate of an old not in use wine house that belongs to my grandfather and is connected by another gate to my backyard and the neighbor's backyard that used to belong to the cousin of the family. For someone who spends her weekends in that home, it isn't creepy at all. I am kind of scared of the backyard, but mostly of the idea of seeing some animal like a mouse or cat or something. My friends felt the unease of being in an old, big country house new to them. So back to the story. My friends and I were in the kitchen preparing dinner or some drinks. I can't remember. So it was already dark. We had music on. We're dancing, having fun. Typical horror movie serial killer target stuff. Then suddenly, we hear a loud bang on the kitchen's wooden window covers. We freak the hell out, turned down the music and just froze looking at each other. The noise came back, followed by a deep manly voice shouting, Hey, not creepy, but threatening old man from the countryside kind of scary. I did not recognize the voice. They all look at me in panic, trying to figure out if I knew what the hell was happening. The living room window covers were open but we were all too scared to look outside to the backyard. So we decided to close them for protection. Having the voice materialized into a visual threat felt way worse than just leaving it to a hopeful fade. In my mind, in a few seconds, I was trying to think of every non creepy scenario where what was happening would be logical. Nothing came to me. My only thought was how the hell could anyone have opened a four meter metal gate to the wine house and get access to the backyard? And why shout and bang on the windows without saying anything else? That had never happened here. I remember that there were some drug addicts that broke into the wine house trying to find stuff to sell when I was barely a baby. So it could have been something like that. We were all freaking out. They asked me if I knew what was going on and I couldn't give anything back. I was the host, so I had to do something. I ran to a cabinet where my father stored his hunting shotgun, which I'd never used, and an air pressure gun that uses little lead ammo. I had pretty good training with this second one, so I take that. Although it couldn't kill anyone, shooting the balls or penis would be enough to stop somebody, enabling us to overpower them. This is Portugal. So not many people have guns and you need a license renovated frequently. And that made me assume that he probably wasn't armed. I was terrified, but adrenaline gave me a helping push and I started shouting, who's out there? No one answered. I peeked through the living room windows and saw no one. 
Only the right side of the backyard was visible, not the back itself that leads to the wine house exit. And I decided it was better to not go outside and wait a bit to see if the creepy man had left. We waited all scared, trying to make sense of what had happened. We didn't even think of calling the police. And after a while, we were back to fun and music, even did a little bonfire in the backyard and tried not to think about it anymore. To this day, I haven't asked my parents who that could have been and why, and still find no possible and reasonable explanation for the deep, hoarse, threatening voice that belonged to no one. This happened on New Year's Eve 2004. I was a good kid. I didn't drink until I was legally old enough. So what happened can't be put down to alcohol. I had been to a New Year's Eve party at a friend's house while her parents were out. When her parents returned, we left them to it and moved the party to another friend's house. Around 5am I decided to call it a night and make my way back home. I walked for 20 minutes before getting to the stage where I had to walk under a motorway. Just to let you know, you cross the bridge and you're under the motorway. So it's essentially an open tunnel with lots of thick pillars. It goes on for quite a while, as there are three roads that it crosses underneath. The first is right at the start, the second 200 meters up, and the final one 300 meters beyond that point. The final one is right at the end where I come out and walk up my street. Just behind the final road is a street light and a working men's club. Now, I had seen a few people scattered about. So when I came to cross to the second road and saw a figure up ahead under the street light, I didn't bat an eyelid, especially with the working men's club behind it. As I got closer, I realized the figure was a girl wearing a fancy dress. She has a costume that would have fitted somewhere between 1900s to 1920s. It was a light color, but our street lights are orange. So everything was disguised by the orange glow. And I couldn't say for certain what color it was. She was standing looking to her right up the road into what could have been oncoming traffic. I remember thinking that she was wearing odd clothes for this time of year but each to their own, and I stared at her right until I was standing directly opposite. The other side of the final road. I looked left and looked right and crossed the road. And by the time I reached the other side, the girl was gone. No cars had passed. There was nothing behind that she could have gone to without me seeing. And I looked away from her for about two seconds. What happened to that girl? When I was 13, the dawning of a new millennium took place on New Year's Eve. While people were fearing the worst with the Y2K bug or out partying and drinking, I was home alone. In 1996, my parents had split up and from there they divorced and my mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone and my mother was currently out of state. Now this didn't worry me as this was not the first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter saying that she had gone to Florida for a few days and that there were some groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she was regularly leaving me alone for long periods of time to go to Florida. We lived on a relatively quiet road surrounded by trees and set a few miles out of town. And I know most of the people, if not by name, then by face, well enough to wave and have small chats with and have never been given a reason to be afraid of being alone. On the night in question, I was staying up late watching television. I remember that I was watching the movie His Bodyguard on USA Channel and had most of the lights on in the house. Not because I was afraid, but because at 13, 
I wasn't concerned with electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within the confines of my bubble of home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird sounds outside, but I remember thinking it was likely just the neighbors. Though they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party, and about halfway into the movie, the power in the house suddenly went dead. I sat on the couch for a minute, just sort of in a panic daze because it was near midnight, and pitch black. I remember thinking the power must have gone out, and that it would come back on in a while. So I decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and wait. A few minutes passed by when I heard a noise in the kitchen, where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest, because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off the dining room, which is connected to the kitchen, which leads directly into the living room, where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I heard the sound, and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Every noise suddenly felt magnified. When footsteps sounded, I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours and crawled around the ottoman, and started, as slowly and as quietly as I could, to make my way towards the space between the love seat and the couch. I knew I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark and the ottoman. From playing hide and seek in the dark many, many times with my friends during sleepovers, I knew this was a good hiding spot. I was nearly there when the footsteps became more pronounced. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen now towards the living room. They weren't hurried or anything. It was like they were just moving around in the kitchen. I glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor. And to my horror, there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two doors. To my credit, I didn't scream. However, I did panic. I stood immediately to my feet from my hiding spot and ran down the hallway. And I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the Ottoman in the dark to follow me. I did what all children do when they're afraid. And I bypassed the front door, the guest bedroom, the bathroom, and ran to the farthest door down the hallway. My room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to get to the front door, unlock it, and open it in time, as it was right off the side of the couch. When I was 10, I got a bird for my birthday. He was a blue fronted Amazon, and I called him Boo, because it was October and close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage. It could have been metal, but it was very large and sturdy, at least six feet tall, and that it was always kept in my room. Despite the fact that Boo, like me, pretty much had run of the house whenever he wanted, this information will become relevant later. As I run into the room, I slammed the door shut and locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn knobs that you could easily pop with a coin or butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked, if they did it to mock me or scare me, but I knew in my heart that my little lock was not going to keep whoever it was on the other side out of my room. It didn't keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to brute force. I was panicking, on the verge of tears when the person began to laugh. It was a low, quiet laugh, which made it even more frightening. It wasn't like manic laughter, but as if they were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me. 
and I started crying heavily and hysterically, and looked around the room for anything I could do. That's when I realized Boo's cage would fit almost perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor, but as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever was on the other side that I was attempting to barricade myself in because suddenly they threw themselves at my door and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted violently. Boo, who had been stirred by the movements, awoke and literally began to scream and flap his wings. I might have screamed with him, but I don't remember doing so. And just remember this terrified and extreme fear overcome me. I crawled under my bed, which is a bunk bed with a futon on the bottom. And several minutes passed, and the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued screaming even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed, it gave me no feelings of being secure. I didn't come out from under it because I had nowhere else to go. I thought about trying to go to the window, but I was too afraid he might be there expecting me on the other side. Not to mention it was also several feet until I hit the ground, as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying under my bed terrified for hours. I must have fallen asleep because I woke up the next day at daylight. The fear of what happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why, and scared that whoever has been in my house might still be there. I decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor's since it was daylight outside, and therefore I felt less afraid. Crawling out is a lot harder than it looks. Once I was back on my feet, however, I carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed the back door was wide open. Scared but feeling braver than I was, as I was now outside, and it was not pitch black, I walked up the back steps and peered inside. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I decided to go in. Looking back, I cringe on how stupid this must have turned out and that I wish I could have told my younger self to make the smarter move and grab help. But thankfully, no one was in the house. I did a terrifying heart pounding room to room check, looking in closets and under beds, behind the couch and anywhere. I thought even a small child might be able to fit. I even popped the locks on my mum's bedrooms so I could check it and then relocked it. And that's when I noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front doors and then called my mum, where I once again broke down crying hysterically. She called a co-worker who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mum still takes random trips to Florida after that, but I always went with her from then going forward. So terrified, laughing, crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve. Please, let's never meet again. As you surely now know, I was generally restricted from going into the cemetery by myself when I was younger, up until I was about 11 or 12. That's when I was glued to my parents' sides when we walked to the property. My uncle Cal used to be the top candidate as my chaperone when neither of my mothers were available. He's a pretty solid dude, and he's willing to knock out anyone who poses a threat to me or anyone else in my family. One morning, when I was six years old, my mothers needed to be at the school to discuss an upcoming festival. Cal wasn't what you would consider a natural when it came to kids. He was so nice and did his very best when he was left to care for me, but he never really mastered the art of talking or playing with me. For example, on this particular day, 
he decided to play hide and seek. This wasn't anything new to me. I'd played all the time with my mums and aunts, but they always knew to go over the rules very carefully before we'd play. Stay in the yard. Don't go into the cemetery. Don't hide in any holes or dens made by animals. And always come out of your hiding spot when the seeker yelled, Ali Ali Oxen Free. Uncle Cow didn't know about these rules, and I wasn't about to remind him. I wanted to find a new hiding spot. If I had to crouch down inside one of the chicken coops one more time, I was going to scream. Cal hated to hide, so he volunteered to seek every time for the game. This was an added bonus. When I played with my parents and their sisters, I had to be the seeker all the time. I was slow, and they were competitive, so they didn't hold back when they got a chance to tag me. You have to count to a hundred, I informed my uncle, as I led him to the shed that would be my home base. And you can't peek. He nodded along and turned to face the wall of the shed. I was running before he even began to count. I wasn't going to hide behind a gravestone or mausoleum. Even at a young age, I knew how disrespectful that would be. But there was a patch of trees in the center of the yard that were calling me. I discovered it a few weeks ago, that one of the trees, an aspen tree, had a low hanging branch that I could climb if I got a running start. Kids climbed one similar to it in the play area at school. I had joined in with them once, but my aunt Gloria who taught me at school with my mum, Katie, was on playground duty that day, and she immediately made me get down. Without an adult to tell me no, and with at least 60 seconds left, I sprinted through the cemetery towards my goal. The tree that I have since named Yulei, after the Edgar Allan Poe poem, welcomed me with yellowing leaves and white branches, hanging down like arms stretched out for a hug. I didn't hesitate. In fact, I picked up speed and lunged as soon as I was within reach. With what I can only call pure luck, I was able to grab onto the lowest branch and pull myself up on the first try. I was only five or so feet off the ground, but I felt as though I had climbed the Denali Peak. Knowing that I could still be seen in my bright blue jacket, I scrambled up a few more branches and positioned myself behind a large cluster of leaves that had yet to fall. By the time I was fully situated, Cal was done counting and had been moving about the yard for a few minutes. He checked in the usual places a six-year-old may have hidden. Most of them were places that I had frequented in hide and seek of days past, and a few places he looked were ones I had never thought of, but catalogued in my brain for the next time I played. I could see him quite easily from my little perch, and I was able to laugh at him without fear of being heard, because he was nowhere near me. He was scratching his head, and double checking everywhere he'd previously looked before, and then went into the house to search. At this point I was getting sore, and leaned back against the trunk of the tree and waited for him to come out. The air was quiet, and I could hear the chirps of some birds nesting in the surrounding trees. If I hadn't been sitting on a narrow branch, sitting 20 feet above the ground, I would have allowed myself to drift off. But I stayed alert, hoping to see my uncle reappear soon. It was then that I felt a tingly feeling on the back of my neck. It wasn't unlike the sensation I got when my mums ran their finger through my hair or rubbed my back. Feeling relaxed, I glanced around and noticed just how still it was in this little oasis centered in the aunt's cemetery. <laughs>
At this point, I was feeling rather euphoric. It wasn't until I was older that I found something that simulated a similar feeling. I wanted to find my mums. I had this overwhelming need to tell them that I loved them and give them a hug. I felt guilty for going into the cemetery and breaking their rules. I quickly began to climb out of the tree and in the process, ended up missing a branch and fell about eight feet to the ground. Later on, I would learn that I broke my wrist and thumb when I landed, but somehow didn't feel the pain and just had to return to my parents. In my delusional state, I decided the best route to take to get to town was through the woods behind the cemetery, probably because I was closer to the woods than I was to the road. But the forest was thick, full of traps that had been set by hunters and forgotten about. It was another place that I was told to avoid. Luckily, I didn't run into any traps that day. There was a pretty clear path that had been made by my mother, Arga, and her siblings back when they were young. So I stuck with that. That's when things got hazy. At some point, the euphoric sensation turned into one of dread. I began to feel as though someone or something was chasing me. I remember crying and calling out for Cal to come and find me. And eventually, I blacked out. When I awoke, I was lying in a pile of leaves and staring up at the night sky, pain flaring up in my right arm and my feet stung. Climbing to my feet, I looked around and realized I was still in the woods. It took me a moment to get my bearings, but as soon as I figured out where I was, I was only a few feet from the path and headed in the direction of the cemetery. My jacket was gone, as were my shoes and socks. I don't know what the hell happened there. My tiny feet were freezing and stung against the rocky ground. When I emerged from the forest in the cemetery, I could see red lights flashing up by the house and I immediately knew who they were for. For a moment, I contemplated turning back and living my life in the woods, but I soldiered on. And by the time I was halfway across the graveyard, I could hear someone shouting my name. It was my mother, Katie. She was the strict one with an Irish temper and a hand made for spanking. When I saw her running through the cemetery gate, I immediately felt a rush of relief. I couldn't run. I was too sore and I could only hold up my left arm, but I called out to her as hot tears steamed down my cheeks. She picked me up, hugged me close, and didn't yell at me for wandering off, nor did she scold me for not wearing coat nor shoes. She just asked me if I was all right and told me she loved me. Even then when adrenaline was coursing through my veins, I was relieved that she was taking pity on me. I was way too drained to get a spanking. Katie took me to the house where a hysterical Arga was waiting with her sisters and my aunt Gloria. I didn't get to stay home though. Once they realized I had been injured out in the woods for nearly 12 hours, I was placed in the waiting ambulance and rushed to the next town for medical care. I was released the next day with a bright pink cast and ordered to stay inside for at least 72 hours. The shaman visited us the next day. He was summoned by my grandfather after I told him about what led me into the woods. My parents stayed with me as I described the ordeal to the shaman. I told him about how happy I felt and about how I longed to be with my parents so much. I went into the woods that I feared more than any grave and mausoleum. After that was said and done, the shaman went out to the path of trees I had been hiding in and began to bless them and burge sage and incense. He told my mothers that I could have been influenced by his spirit, but he said that it was likely a young child had passed and missed their parents. Katie, who wasn't as superstitious as her wife, was skeptical of this explanation, 
She believed in spirits and all, but she didn't think they had the power to control living beings. But she didn't have a reasonable explanation as to why her six-year-old wandered into the woods and blacked out. So they allowed the shaman to go through with his rituals and reinforce their rule that I wasn't allowed to go into the cemetery alone. Uncle Cal, who had been royally terrified after the ordeal, was the only one to yell at me. I was surprised. He was always a pretty chill guy, and he never really got onto me before. But he had been terrified that he'd lost me forever. And when he found out that it was all because I had broken a rule that I was very familiar with, he blew his top. This was one of the many experiences that occurred in my childhood. I wish I knew more about what caused it, but even my tribe's leader have no explanation. They just used it as an excuse to warn children to not wander about on hallowed land. This happened on New Year's Eve 2010, turning into 2011. My dad, sister and I were at my uncle's New Year's Eve party. I was 17 at the time, my sister 15. And between me, my sister, our two cousins, and aunt's relatives' kids, there were about 10 teenagers at this party. Some important background. At the time, we lived in a rural area in central Florida. And while the area, for the most part, was a nice place to live, there can be no denying that it is deep south, and some areas are still more bound to be the old ways of the south than others. It's also important to know, it's just how deep the bond between my sister and I is. Like I said, I was 17, she was 15, and she was and still is my absolute best friend. Just about everything I did and do I did with her, and vice versa. We had all the same interests, friends groups, and what we didn't have in common, we still loved to share and try and introduce each other to. By every definition, we are inseparable. So here we are, a group of rowdy, loud-mouthed teenagers at a party. It's only about 9pm, and we were all restless in need of something to do. One of us brought up the local cemetery that was a five-minute drive from my uncle's house that was reputed amongst locals to be very haunted. Its oldest graves dated back to the late 1700s to early 1800s. It wasn't just the age that gives this cemetery its reputation, but rather its history. It was also the site of several lynchings of innocent black people by white supremacists. It was also where a woman was stoned to death for adultery and or witchcraft, again in the late 1700s to early 1800s. Naturally, we convinced my dad and uncle to take us, so we all piled into the back of my uncle's huge truck. We girls in the cabin with dad and uncle and the boys in the back, and set off for some spooky exploration. To get to this cemetery, you must drive about a mile's worth of dirt road through virgin land. So a mile in the dark on a road completely canopied by enormous live oaks and palms. Forestry so thick, you can't see more than 15 to 20 feet in front of you. So it was already an unnerving atmosphere before we even arrived to the cemetery properly. Before we entered, the dirt road curved to the left, and on the outer part of the curve was a row of juniper trees that were around 20 to 25 feet tall. When that grove came into view, I suddenly saw a face peering straight at us from above those trees. It was the face of a young man, and when I say I saw a face, I don't mean I caught a brief glimpse of some transparent could-be face. This guy looked flesh and blood, and alive. I can even remember distinctly what he looked like. Medium skin tone for a black person, a broad, flat nose, shortish, curled hair, 
and green eyes that reflected in the headlights like a cat's eyes, and a completely blank, emotionless expression. I stared at him for a solid five seconds or so, before he just vanished. I sat there stunned, wondering if I should even say anything. But then, one of the other girls started to freak out. Did you see that? Did you see that man? She screamed. Keep in mind, those juniper trees were at least 20 feet tall, and there were no other trees or growths near them for another 30 feet or so. There was nothing he could have been standing on, not to mention the way the face just blinked out of existence. Still, we stopped, and one of the men looked behind the junipers out of curiosity. They found absolutely nothing, and no one. Equally strange, is even though he was dead ahead of us and very visible, only that one other girl and I saw him at the exact same time, and no one else did. In the cemetery itself, a few other less pronounced things happened. But they boiled down to me and a few others in the group, feeling a very negative presence. We left after about five minutes, when we returned to my uncle's house. I noticed that my sister seemed off. She's usually more reserved, but now she's dead silent, and very quick to anger, which was an unusual trait for her. Our uncle tried to lighten the mood by pranking us and throwing a firecracker into the garage. My sister, who is normally a fan of pranks, on top of being quiet, just looks over on him and shouts at him. Keep in mind she was 15 and still hesitant to be rude to her elders, southern upbringing and that, and it was kind of a dick move on my uncle's part, but certainly not worthy of an outburst, and it was very out of character. After a while, the conversation veered off and changed into a subject I had no interest in, so I got up to look at the firework. My sister got up and followed me, and as I said, we're inseparable. I walked out of the garage with my sister right behind me and to the side. I didn't pay her much attention as I was enjoying the fireworks, and a particularly big one went off, and I made some comment and she didn't respond. So I turned to look at her and repeat to myself, only she wasn't there. She was still sitting in the garage with the group, and this creepy zoned out thousand yard stare is plastered on her face. I'm telling you, I saw someone standing behind me. She was standing to the side and not completely behind me, but I saw her right at my shoulder, constantly in my peripheral sight. As soon as I turned to look directly at her, she vanished, or was never there to begin with, as she was in the garage. As the night dragged on, she got stranger and stranger. Her pupils were fully dilated, even when we brought her into a brightly lit room. Worse still, she complained of severe neck pain, and a rash began to form around her neck. A rash that was in the exact pattern of a rope burn on a hanging victim. The rash spread to no other parts of her body. Our dad had to rub on some antihistamine cream, and I looked it over, but it wasn't inflamed, swollen, or itchy. It was just there, more like a birthmark than a true rash. She spoke like she was drugged, very spaced out, not wanting anything except water. She kept complaining that her neck hurt. When we were freaking out over her pupils, she would just be like, oh, weird, and go for more water. By this point, we'd had enough, and got some of my aunt's things and my cousin, who had dabbled in all religions and is very spiritual, prayed over my sister, begged her to toughen up and give whatever was doing this the boot. Just a few minutes before midnight, her usual personality returned, and the flash faded as spontaneously as it appeared. The pupil stayed somewhat dilated for a while longer, and she complained of headaches, but otherwise she was fine. Whatever. At least it passed. 
We've discussed that night several times since then, but only recently did we discover a detail that made both of our blood run cold. Though neither of us can remember the exact time clearly, my sister swears she remembers going out to the car around the time we were in the garage, talking to the other teens. Somehow she mistakenly thought we were going to be leaving then. And she says she does not remember how long she waited in the car. But it was a while. A few minutes before midnight, she realized the New Year's Eve ball was about to drop. And we were staying for it. And then she returned inside. Only because she was never in the car. I kept her with me the entire time. I was genuinely freaked out because even if it had nothing to do with that cemetery, I was genuinely concerned there may have been something medical going on and was trying to figure out what it could have been. When I told my sister this, I don't think I've ever seen a look more terrified on her face. She genuinely only remembers just sitting in the car wondering where everyone else was. She passed out and was okay. This past New Year's Eve, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their mums. I was home for the holidays from college, and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mum and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans, so I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live that is big on shopping and resorts. We plan to have a pretty calm night, watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown and have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the West Coast, the ball drop is at nine. So around eight, we ventured from our hotel, walked to the block party about a mile away. And on the way we passed a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spent 15 minutes dancing, but didn't get any drinks. It was a gay bar, and Sarah and Rachel, being gay, were stoked on it and wanted to come back after the ball dropped, even though it was about 90% men there. We continue on to the block party, get some dinner, a glass of champagne, and the ball dropped, and they had a DJ. So we spent about an hour in there dancing, after we got tired of it, we opted to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mum pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves soon after that as she was tired. It being 1030 at this point, and Sarah and Rachel and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun. Rachel tried some of my drink since it was one she hadn't tried before. I constantly have my guard up when drinking in public, and I felt safe at this bar because it was 90% gay men, who I thought would have no interest in me. I went back to the bar to get a second drink, and that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well even though I was feeling fine not 10 minutes previously. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor, and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel, now worried, somehow drags my half lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted, asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decide to take me back to the hotel about half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious, and there were barely sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us who was walking nearby. But they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body from the ground. And at one point, I threw up all over myself, both of them, and the sidewalk. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah and Rachel doesn't have any memory of this part. Still struggling to carry me 
the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave. Her friend needed help right now, and he didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street, asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he can help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off, something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women or I'm gonna call the police, and he left. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife enjoying the holidays ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong and then carried me the rest of the way to my hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely and him and his wife left. And this is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door and it's the EMT and his wife. They came to let us know that a man followed us into the hotel, and they just saw him hop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to locate him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the same man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body and dry heaving after that. I woke up next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that happened. Feeling like crap, I thought I must have drunk way too much, but I'd never blacked out before in my life, and the amount of drink I had didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, since Rachel had some of it and had no memory of our walk home, even though she was fully functional. I'm sure that man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something into my drink. To this day, I don't really know how I could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, I had good friends and kind strangers protecting me that night. It keeps me up at night thinking what could have happened under different circumstances. This is from when my parents first began living together. Katie grew up in a fairly large city, just a few hours from our village. Her mother was a nurse who occasionally brought medical supplies to the more remote areas of the state and provided vaccines for those who wanted them. They met Aga and her family when they were about nine or 10. They were all friends and Grandma Mary would sometimes leave Katie and her twin sister Gloria there overnight while she visited other villages. When they reached their teens, Katie and Aga began secretly dating, and eventually they broke the news to their families. Grandma Mary was a devout Catholic, and took it surprisingly well. Popo and Ma Aga's parents were a bit unnerved by the whole thing. They had never really dealt with homosexuality within their tribe, and they were convinced that their ancestors would strike them down if they allowed the two girls to continue their courtship. When the community and council members voted on it though, they all agreed, so long as Aga and her family maintained their faith and upheld the customs of their people, no harm would come to them from the union. Once they had the blessing from both women's families, they were allowed to move in together. They were barely 17 at the time, but that's how it was within our village. There was no ceremonies, they just went from living apart to living together. This represented betrothal. The house they moved into was small and only about a half mile away from the main house where we eventually moved. But at the time, it was Papa and Moore's house. Katie and Arga swear that the shack was once a charming little cottage with a beautiful red door 
and matching shutters, but all I know is that it's currently a condemned structure that gives me splinters just looking at it. Arga worked with her father on most weekdays. Her older brother was a fisherman, and he had no interest in the family business, so my mother was next in line to inherit. She loved the cemetery and the funeral home, because she felt that she enjoyed providing a place for closure to those who were going through the most challenging times in their lives. Sometimes she worked long hours, so Katie would spend most of her time in the town teaching, or at the house cleaning or cooking. At the time, she wasn't too put off with the cemetery in her backyard. It was a peaceful place, and she never gave it a second thought. One afternoon, she was outside cleaning the windows. She had music playing from the radio inside, so she didn't hear the truck approaching on the dirt path until it was right behind her. She didn't recognize that it was one of Arga's family members' vehicles, so she immediately stopped what she was doing so that she could welcome the stranger. She was a debutante, and hospitality was very important. The man who stepped out the truck was white, which wasn't odd there. There were a few families in the valley, and even some Russians. They rarely made it to this part of the property, though. The main house was where the funeral home was, and all business was performed up there. Thinking that he may have been lost, Katie waved at the gentleman, who had to have been in his late thirties to early forties. He was handsome, with an almost rugged look to him. Overall, he seemed very approachable. The only thing that seemed off about him was his lack of jacket. He was only wearing a flannel shirt and blue jeans. It was 30 degrees out in our town in this part of the country, where it can sometimes be dark all day. This was one of those times. With no sun and a substantial amount of wind, it was foolish to go outside without some sort of coat. Katie was only out there because the windows were driving her nuts. How can I help you? She asked him as he meandered towards the porch. Do you have a dog? The guy seemed out of breath as he looked about the property, as though he were looking for something. No, no dog, Katie told him. The stranger pointed to the wooded area on the east side of the property. There's a dog stuck in a trap just off the path over there. Do you know whose it might be? It's brown with a black muzzle. Immediately, Katie stepped off the porch and looked towards the trees. I have no idea. Could you not get it out of the trap? She was, and still is, a sucker for animals. She has a habit of bringing home strays and injured wildlife to this day. I don't have any tools with me. The gentleman pointed to his truck. Do you have a crowbar or even a screwdriver? I can probably take the trap apart if you don't mind keeping the thing calm while I do it. It didn't occur to Katie that it would probably have been better to get someone stronger to assist him than zeroing in on a petite woman who could barely reach the top of her windows. It also didn't occur to her that the man had driven from a different part of the property, and that he would have come from the other side of the house if he was coming from the woods. All she knew was that a dog was hurt, and that she wanted to help it. She ran into the house and dug through the chest, where they kept all the tools that Arga's brother had given them when they moved in. She found the tools he requested, as well as some flashlights, and followed him to his truck. She had not yet been jaded by a world filled with criminals and pervs, so she didn't think twice about going off with a fellow Good Samaritan. The man drove fast, and when they got close to the edge of the forest, he drove off the path to get a shortcut that most of the hunters in the area used. It dawned on Katie that the man didn't have a gum rack in the cab of his truck, and that he was hardly dressed for a hunting trip. 
She glanced at the floor behind her seat, searching for a coat or some kind of jumper that he may have changed out of, but she didn't see anything of the sort. When the truck stopped, she asked him about his attire. She suggested that they go to her brother-in-law's cabin to get a coat, and he immediately refused. My jacket is with the dog, he explained motioning for her to follow him up the path. The poor thing looked cold, and I wanted him to be at least a little comfortable as he waited for me. This eased Katie's nerves. He's a nice guy, taking care of a dog. They walked up the path that Katie had only ever been on once or twice before. As kids, they explored the woods, but they never went into this area for fear of being shot. With no daylight, they would at least be safe from hunters. But there were still other elements to worry about, like bears and foxes. The man led the way, shining the flashlight over the path to make sure they were going the right way. They walked for nearly a half hour, before Katie stopped and took in the surroundings. She asked if they were getting close to the dog, and the gentleman nodded. It's near the pass up ahead. He's sort of off the path, so keep an ear out. He turned and gave her a smile that even today, she calls charming in a Ted Bundy kind of way. As though he sensed her discomfort, the guy started a little dialogue with her. I'm Aaron, by the way. I live out by the border. You from round these parts? Confused, Katie bit back the urge to throw a no shit at him. He had just taken her from her house. What did he think? Was she a tourist who cleaned windows for giggles? Rather than be rude, she primly hummed an affirmative while shining her flashlight right and left looking for the dog. Are you married? Aaron went on. While Katie asked him what brought him to the conclusion, he reminded her that she'd mentioned a brother-in-law. Is your husband not home? Wife, actually, Katie corrected. She's down the road. She'll be home soon. She felt that it was important to add that, even though it wasn't true, Aga wasn't expected home for another few hours, actually but she wanted to make the guy know that she might have had people looking for her soon. Aaron was quiet for a few seconds. They'd reached a rocky incline on the trail, and he seemed to be focusing on that. Once the silence began to settle, he let out a chuckle. That's pretty hot. Two women in all. While grateful that he wasn't like a lot of people when they first found out about their relationship, rude, and disgusted, Katie almost always found his reaction even worse. For the sake of remaining polite, she faked a laugh. Ah, sure. So, how do you, you know? He stopped walking and turned to face her. Katie really hoped that he wasn't talking about what she thought he was talking about. How do we do what? You know, screw, he clarified, with a casual shrug. Disgusted, Katie stepped back. That's none of your business. She tried to remain calm, but the man's sudden change in attitude had her on edge. Can we please just get the dog? Oh, oh yeah. Aaron looked around, as though he forgot why they were there in the first place. He laughed sheepishly and shook his head. I'm so sorry, ma'am, but there's no dog. I just brought you out here for a good time. His cavalier attitude gave Katie pause. She let his words sink in for a second, figuring that she had to have misheard. But when he began to unzip his pants, she knew that she had heard right. In Katie's retelling of the event, some small details change here and there, but one thing 
was always constant in her response at that exact moment of realization. Shit. She didn't give him a chance before slamming her flashlight repeatedly into his head, throat, and chest. She basically hit him as many times as she could until he fell to the ground. When she knew he was unconscious, she turned on heel and ran back the way they came. She didn't know exactly where she was, but she figured that if she stayed on the path, that she would eventually find her way. And she was right. She saw the truck at the edge of the field, right at the opening of the path. She checked the vehicle, and was relieved to see that he'd left the keys in the ignition. She drove it across the field towards the main house, where she found Pawpaw, Arga, and Arga's brother, Cal. The three of them were horrified when they heard her account of what had just happened, and the men immediately went into the woods to find the injured man. Meanwhile, Arga called the authorities, aka Jimmy the town appointed sheriff, with a collection of European muskets and three dogs that could tear the skin off a man's bone if ordered to. Jimmy arrived as Paw Paw and Cal were returning with the latter pulling Aram by the foot through the mud. He was taken to a jail, aka the concrete cell off Jimmy's house, where he remained until the police from a nearby city came to collect him and perform an official investigation. As it turns out, Aram was a fisherman from the coast, and he visited friends in our area once or twice a year. He had tagged along with some of these friends when they were visiting Cal at the funeral home, and at some point, it was innocently mentioned that Katie was at the house, and that she was home alone, or something like that. When he found himself with some alone time, Aaron borrowed a truck, and found the house, and the beautiful Katie alone, as promised. They never really got an answer as to why he thought it was okay to take a woman into the woods for nefarious reasons. He was a relatively attractive guy, and he seemed normal for the most part. In the end, he got a little bit of prison time, and he was banned from our village. That was the most they could do, really, given that he actually didn't do anything to Katie. After all, he was the one who came out with most of the injuries. That's one of the rare occasions that something scary happened on our property that didn't involve the cemetery or funeral home, but it was definitely the first time one of my mothers came face to face with the true evils of the world. This all happened Tuesday night. My significant other Kyle and I went to an absolutely fantastic concert for New Year's Eve. We met up with a few friends, but they all left right after midnight. The bands were great, so we wanted to stay for the rest of the show. Kyle got a call from a good friend, Nathan, at around 1am. Nathan said that he was at the same bar, and wanted to know if we were still there. We were stoked, because Nathan never gets out the house. He's a super cool guy and we love hanging out with him, and he had a girlfriend with him who I like a lot, and his friend, Derek. I don't like Derek. At all. Derek just gives off a creepy vibe. He talks slow and monotone, and he stares for too long and leans in too close. He is Nathan's pity friend. They were best friends for a long time, and Derek's family did a lot for Nathan during a rough patch. Nathan will bring him along every now and again, because he feels obligated to at this point, but he has no trust in him whatsoever. Derek is a drug addict. Anyway, we all hang out and have some laughs. Derek sits there being all freaky as usual, just staring at everyone. When he would speak, it would be something off the wall and completely unrelated to anything anyone was talking about. Once he looked at Dawn and I and said, I think it'd be really weird if you two made out. Okay, yeah, it would be weird. We ignored that and kept on having fun. The bar closed, 
and Kyle asked them if they wanted to come to our house and have some more drinks and play foosball and Tekken. I was a little annoyed because he didn't okay this with me first, and I was ready for bed. I wasn't that upset though. I know that Kyle just likes to have company. And I told him I wouldn't mind if it was just Nathan and Dawn, as I didn't want Derek in our house, and I don't trust him. Kyle brushed it off and says, What's the worst that can happen? It'll be fine, he's just weird. Well, when we're all leaving, we had to wait for Derek in the parking lot for the longest time. Turns out he was waiting outside the door of the bar and trying to get any girl to come with him, bribing them with free pills. I got mad and said, what makes you think it's okay to invite random people into my house? He just laughed. We get to my house and he sits on the couch by me. He keeps poking me. And when I ask him what he wants, he stares for 10 seconds before saying, what's up? I started ignoring him. He continued to poke me and tickle my feet, and I wouldn't even look over. Then he starts getting phone calls from people asking for pills. I went to the bathroom, and he tried to follow me in there. I pushed him out, locked the door, and he knocked. After this, he starts trying to get Nathan and Dawn to take him home, which was 45 minutes away, and it's 4am. They tell him no way. They had agreed he was staying with them, and they actually wanted to go to their house and sleep in their own bed 10 minutes away. He didn't want to go to their house. He wanted to go home or stay at our place. He started whining and telling me that I had to convince them to stay. I told him no. So he began saying Dawn had too much to drink to drive. The girl had one beer the entire night. When they were getting ready to leave, Derek comes back in and says he needs to use the restroom. Kyle is overly trusting of people and doesn't pay attention to the weird behavior, but I'm the opposite. So I keep an eye on dodgy Derek. I caught him going through my prescription bottles. They were nothing but antibiotics, but it pissed me off that he was trying to steal from us. And I told him he needed to leave immediately. He then stood in our kitchen, refusing to leave, staring at us. And I said that they were waiting on him and that he needed to go now. Don't you remember the time I gave you guys a ride? Well, make it even. You either convince them to stay or I'll stay here and y'all take me home. No way. He gave us a ride home when we had a flat once and we lived two blocks apart at the time. We weren't going 45 minutes away to take a weirdo home that's refusing to leave for unknown reasons. He kept saying that Dawn was drunk, and Kyle speaks up and says, if you get in a roadblock, I'll come to get you. And he says, well, are you gonna post the bail too? Because we're your responsibility now. I'm beyond frustrated at this point, and told Kyle, you invited them, now get rid of him and I went to sit on the couch. Derek continued to stand there and stare at Kyle. Kyle, normally passive, is getting angry and telling him it's time for him to go and that we aren't taking him home or convincing anyone to stay. Derek says that he's not leaving, so he has to do one or the other. Kyle finally went outside and got Nathan to come, literally drag Derek to the car and the next morning, Nathan called and asked if we were missing an iPhone, because Derek mysteriously has one now. Yes, in fact, my old iPhone was missing from the drawer. It was off, and I'd rather just let Derek keep it than communicate with him further. Nathan has apologized profusely and says that he isn't bringing Derek around anymore. When I was around 12, I spent New Year's Eve at my friend's house whilst our parents were out to a restaurant in a nearby town. The house was old and pretty isolated, and to be honest, it scared the crap out of me. You had to drive up a long, overgrown track to reach it, 
a lot of my other friends at school would say the house was haunted, and it was actually featured in a ghost book if I remember rightly. So anyway, we were sat downstairs in the lounge watching some TV, and heard the loudest crashing sound. I still remember the look in my friend's eyes when we turned to each other in shock. It took us a while to get up, and actually go investigate where the sound was coming from, and what it was. We crept out the lounge down the hallway to the rest of the house. The crashing sounded like it came from upstairs, so we headed up to check it out. When we got to the top of the stairs, there was a breeze coming from somewhere. It was ice cold. We moved down the hallway upstairs towards the wind, and turned to go down another corridor. Bear in mind this house was massive, and honestly, it was near enough a mansion from the 1920s. At the end of the corridor was his parents' bedroom. The door was moving back and forth slowly. We both stopped, and just stood still frozen, and not saying a word to each other. After a moment, my friend walked towards the door. I was still frozen in fear, and fell behind a little. As he pushed the door open and snuck into the room, the darkness consumed him. I could barely make out his silhouette. There was perfect silence for a few seconds before I heard him let out the most terrifying scream. My adrenaline kicked in, and I ran towards the room to see what had happened. I searched for the light and turned it on. He was stood frozen stiff and pale, just staring into an empty corner of the room. Just to the side of him was a massive antique mirror that was smashed into pieces, with shards of glass scattered all over the floor. I placed my arm on his shoulder and asked him if he was okay. She broke the mirror. Who? The woman in the corner. She told me to. At that point, I was honestly like, screw this and told him we should leave. He turned to leave with me, and just before we did, I wanted to check the mirror. Surely the wire had broken or something. I bent down to inspect, turned it over, and the string that was still holding it to the wall was intact. It hadn't snapped. I looked at the wall. The nail was also still firmly fixed to the wall. At that point, I was so terrified, I told him to call his parents and tell them to come home. We waited outside the front door, until our parents arrived from the restaurant. My dad and his went straight up to the bedroom to check it out. When they arrived, they saw the broken mirror. They sort of pushed it off and said we were up to no good, and playing a game that got out of hand. And after that night, my friend never really spoke about it to me. The worst part is that I'm 24 now, and was having a general chat with my mum as New Year's is coming up soon. That night came up. I told her about it and she said, I believe you. Your friend's mum told me a few days after that night that she had seen a woman in her room telling her to leave the house. It honestly sent my whole body tingling, and I had flashbacks to that night. It's honestly sent my whole body tingling, and I had flashbacks to that night, with it being 12 years ago now. To this day, I still can't work out how the mirror fell off the wall. It would have had to have been physically lifted up and over the hook. I think it's best if I just forget it. I don't like trying to picture the woman my friend kept saying he saw. I am a female in my late twenties. My parents, a charming lesbian couple, owned a funeral home and cemetery in a village on the outskirts of the Alaskan tundra. It was a small business that had been passed down from my grandmother Agatha's father, 
who inherited it from his father and so on. Katie, my other mother, was terrified of the whole situation from the beginning. She was positive that someone would get possessed with us living so close to a field of corpses, in her words. Over time, exactly eight years after they moved there, she grew to respect the land, as well as the tenants resting in peace there. I was born shortly after her change of heart, but she still limited my access to the cemetery. And while no one was ever possessed, we still had our fair share of terrifying experiences at our home and throughout the property. I went to a tiny schoolhouse every weekday from the time I could walk. Only 13 or so children lived in our town, so we were all educated in one room by a small group of teachers. Katie and her twin sister Gloria were two of these teachers. The three of us would walk to and from town every day, while Arga and her brother Cal took care of the property. It was a 20 minute trek, but on the occasional day without freezes, we got to take our bikes, and that was generally the highlight of my life. However, on this particular day in December, we had to walk. We were only at the school until about four o'clock that afternoon, but the sun usually set around 3.30, so we were shrouded mostly in darkness by the time we got up to the dirt road leading up to our property. I was about six or seven at the time, and still used my clumsiness as an excuse not to walk up the path, muddied by snow. Glory had drawn the short straw and was giving me a piggyback ride up the hill. I was resting my head against her back and staring at the cemetery that was beginning to come into view around the paper birches and spruce trees. It was a sprawling field filled with an odd assortment of mausoleums, colourful tombs of Inuit and the Russian Orthodox citizens, and I was always entranced by the graves, and tried to pick out the ones that I had yet to see. We were nearly to the house, when I saw a figure standing in the far right corner of the cemetery. It was hard to discern their age or gender, but I could tell from the build that it wasn't Arga or Cal, Visiting hours ended at sundown regardless of the date, so I immediately pointed the person out to Katie. Most of the finer details are recalled by my parents and older family members, due to my young age throughout most of these events, but I can still clearly remember hearing Katie mutter, shit, quietly under her breath. She helped me off Glory's back, and ordered that I go inside to tell Cal to meet them in the field. Without hesitation, I suddenly found myself as sure-footed as a bunny on the icy ground, and sprinted the last 20 or so yards up to the house. I swung the door open, and went into the kitchen where I knew I'd find Arga and Cal, and told my uncle to get the trespasser. Groaning, Cal finished his cup of coffee, which was probably spiked with whiskey, and stood from the table. Angak Cal was a big guy, about six foot eight, with broad shoulders and what I called Fred Flintstone fists. Basically, he could knock someone out without much effort and he did so time and time again. He was insanely protective of his sisters, and all of the other women in his life, Glory and Katie included. The entire town respected him and feared him at the same time. He was a nice home security system. Naturally, I was thrilled with this tiny bit of excitement in my normally humdrum life when my uncle charged out the back without so much as a coat on, I turned my pleading eyes to Arga, who barely flinched at the activity. She stared back at me for only a moment, 
before sighing and motioning to the rack by the door. I grabbed her parka and helped her put it on as we made our way outside. Knowing that her wife was going to be none too thrilled with my presence in the cemetery, Arga picked me up when we reached the cast iron fence that surrounded the property. We could see Cal's giant silhouette approaching the tiny ones of Katie and Glory. The stranger was still a good 100 or so yards from us. Let's hide and watch, I whispered to Arga, when I realized that Katie hadn't spotted us yet. For a moment, I thought my mother would shake her head and go to the others. But she surprised me by giving me a conspiring smile and ducked behind a mausoleum. We can get to grandmother's grave if we're very quiet, she told me with a glint in her eye. She loved the graveyard and had spent her childhood playing in it while also learning about her ancestors and the people of her town. She wanted me to enjoy it as much as she did. We hurried from grave to grave, pausing only long enough to make sure the others didn't see us. Katie, Glory, and Cal were moving swiftly as well, but they were too busy eyeing the figure, standing only about 20 feet from the large tomb that encased my great-grandmother, our destination. When we arrived at the tomb, Arga set me down, and we crouched behind the rocks and wood that surrounded Grandmother's altar. It was then that I began to feel nerves eat away at my gut. This was a stranger, I could tell. They were standing at the base of the mausoleum, built to honor the infants who had passed before being blessed by the tribe's shaman. This was an old outdated site that didn't fully honor Inuit customs, though it had been redone in the 1970s, closer to the northern section of the property. No one came to this site because it would be considered disrespectful to their deceased, but it would have just been as disrespectful to tear it down. So it was just a derelict memorial that loomed on the tiny hilltop of that section of the cemetery. Tension filled the air as Cal, flanked by Katie and Glory, approached the stranger. I could hear my uncle speaking to them, likely telling them our hours and asking them if they'd like a ride back into town. He always started off nice, giving people the benefit of the doubt before going into Hulk mode. Arga, who had initially been giggling at the sight of her brother looming over the trespasser, was beginning to cling tighter to me as time went by. It took us a few minutes to realize that the person hadn't been responding to Cal, nor had they even looked his way. They continued to stare at the area just above the mausoleum. Katie and Gloria were exchanging uneasy glances at one point, and Cal told them to go back to the house. They refused and stepped closer to his side. When words failed, Cal resorted to the physical approach. He later recalled that he could tell the person was an old man, and that they were frail, and that he didn't want to hurt them. But he wasn't listening, and if he was deaf, he'd have to get his attention somehow. My uncle placed a gentle hand on the gentleman's shoulder, and immediately he felt a wave of nausea overcome him. He hunched over, clutching his abdomen, and cried out. Aga ordered me to stay put before darting off out from behind the stones and over to her brother who waved to her and the other women to make them leave. He insisted they go inside, but they were all frozen in place. The strange man still hadn't moved, so Katie yelled at him once more. She stepped around in front of him and waved a hand in his face. You need to leave. I'd heard her command. You can't be here after dark, it's not safe. No, it's not, the stranger finally said. He lowered his eyes to meet at my mother. Are you all right, dear? 
He spoke so casually to her. She stood there in shock for a good moment. She looked back at Cal, who was on his knees at this point. While she was distracted, the man turned and headed towards the exit. When he was coming towards my hiding spot, I had every intention of getting up and running away, but I was frozen in place. It felt like my body was being held down by weights, and I was sinking into the earth. I whimpered and buried my face in my arms, praying to God and my great grandmother for safety. The ice and leaves crunched in my ears, and I knew Arga realized my predicament and said something to the others, because I could hear Katie shouting at her. Finally summoning the courage, I looked up to see the man walking right by me. He didn't so much as look my way, but as he passed, he said, Good night, blue eyes, in a dulcet whisper. Immediately, I relaxed and climbed to my feet. I watched him practically float out of the cemetery and towards the road. Katie came and got me, telling me we had to take my uncle to the hospital. As it turns out, Cal had to go in for some emergency surgery because his appendix had ruptured. He's convinced that the old man somehow cursed him on contact. Even Arga, sweet but superstitious Arga, had her doubts about his claim. There was nothing malicious in Cal's approach to the man. Why would he have cursed him? This wasn't the last time we saw this strange man. We actually saw him two or three more times in the following weeks. He was always at the derelict infant's mausoleum, staring up at the sky. He never spoke or bothered anyone, and from that point on he always came while it was light out. I would sometimes sneak out and watch him from my grandmother's grave. He was a white man, which struck a chord with me. It was my theory that he was Katie and Gloria's real father, who had abandoned them when they were still very young. Katie quickly disproved this theory, telling me that their father died in the early 90s. But that meant nothing to me. It could still be him. The last time I saw him was in early February the following year. It was snowing heavily, and I was helping Aga and Cal go about and check to see if all the tombs and mausoleums were closed. Sometimes family members of the deceased would perform rituals on their newly departed, placing ceremonial offerings on their bodies, but they weren't always restored to their tombs to the way they were. We did our best to ensure that none of the graves would be flooded come the next thaw. When we approached Grandmother's grave, I heard Arga sigh airily, but continued on. Immediately, I looked to the old mausoleum and smiled to the back of the old man. Good morning, I called out to him. There's no such thing, blue eyes. I heard him respond this over the wind. I began to laugh because it sounded like something Gloria would say after a night of drinking. But suddenly I felt a ball of sadness coil up in my stomach. I began crying and looked up at Arga with a sorrowful pout. It was the first time I had really ever felt dread and it nearly brought me to my knees. Arga picked me up and took me inside where I instantly felt better. The man was never seen on the property again. I was a little sad about it, but the adults were glad. They didn't like the pull that he had on us. When I was still a baby, my Aunt Dawn's friend Eddie came to work for us. He didn't have any qualifications other than being strong and willing to work around dead people, so he was hired. Eddie was a bit weird, and according to Arga, he had a super obvious crush on Dawn. Dawn, the sweetest summer child, didn't think anything of it. She insisted that he was just a shy kid, who didn't know how to talk to people, let alone girls. <laughs> 
With her being the prettiest girl in her class, she took it upon herself to befriend the older teens. She was only about 15 when this all happened, and Eddie was 17. This event does not involve any violence against my aunt. I want to make it clear. Now, a little something about the property. It is an absolute treasure trove of eclectic tombs and mausoleums. But there are also dens and caves close to the woods, where nature has been left alone. While there aren't really any animals that use these dwellings, we still leave the spaces be, so that they are there during blizzard season. On the morning that Eddie started, Katie found him taking a nap in one of these dens. He hadn't even been there an hour. A few hours later, he came inside and asked for a snack. Though he hadn't done much work, Katie made him a sandwich. And when he'd finished eating it, she requested that he go into the funeral parlor and help Arga with inventory. He nodded and hurried into the doors that led to the parlor. When Arga came in less than 10 minutes later, Katie asked how Eddie was doing. Arga seemed confused and when Katie told them what she asked the kid to do, she said that he'd never come in. The two of them went looking for him, and they found him sleeping in one of the empty caskets in the showroom. Fed up and slightly concerned, my parents asked if he'd gotten enough sleep the night before, and offered him the guest room for the rest of the day, and he could finish his chores the next day if need be. Eddie apologized and declined their offer. It's just a hangover. I'm okay now, he admitted with his blank face and monotone voice. With that, he got to work. He helped Arga with the rest of the inventory, repaired the bulldozer, and even repainted the front gate of the cemetery. He was a model employee by dinner time. Dawn made him some stew and brought it out to him. I had been a pill all afternoon, crying and screaming because of an earache, and my mothers didn't want to subject anyone outside of the family to the horror. A few minutes after she'd left, Dawn came back in to get Arga. She said she could hear Eddie screaming but couldn't find him. The two sisters went out, and sure enough, there was no peace to be found inside or outside that evening. They tracked Eddie's shouts to the cemetery. That was the easy part. The graveyard was pretty big, and sound traveled funny there. Some places echoed, in other parts, the sound was muffled. Poor Paul, my grandfather, always told me that the restless spirits in the quieter places and that sound didn't travel much, as they needed a little extra piece until they found themselves. Eddie was probably pissing off a lot of spirits that day, because he was practically shrieking. Arga and Dawn split up first, searching the dens where Katie had seen him that morning, and then spreading throughout the actual tombs. After nearly 20 minutes, Dawn called for Arga to come over, to one of the covered plots near the fence. It was covered because there was to be a burial there the following day. They didn't dig too far normally, due to the ground almost being frozen. But they still had to clear three or four feet to make room for the base of the tombs. My uncle Cow had dug the plot a few days earlier, and he was going to come over the next day to help Eddie set up the rest of the site. Eddie was lying inside the shallow hole, holding his mangled knee to his chest, and screaming Dawn was staring down at him, at a loss. She was small, and couldn't help this big guy if he wasn't fully coherent. Arga was equally stunned at first, but as soon as she saw the scratches on the kid's face, she assumed it was some sort of animal attack. Climbing into the hole next to Eddie, Arga turned him on his back so that she could fully examine him. But as soon as he was facing up, he began screaming about the sun hurting his eyes and started scratching at his face. 
Aga and Dawn tried to calm him down, but when they failed, Dawn ran to get Cal from the house. He was much bigger than Eddie, and could easily overpower him if need be. When he arrived, he sent his sisters inside. He asked them to call the town doctor and inform him that he was bringing Eddie in immediately. They watched Cal load Eddie into the truck and sped off down the road towards town. It wasn't until earlier the next morning that they got any kind of answer as to what happened. Eddie was a babbling mess, speaking in mostly broken Inupiaq. When he finally strung together a proper sentence, he began describing a giant hairless canine beast that attacked him when his back was turned. He said that it bit into his shoulder and transformed him into a wolf. Cal, who was very superstitious, believes that Eddie was attacked by a Kikron, an Inuit version of the Hellhound. Only it looks like a supersized baby ferret with fangs. It has never been told that a Quirkron's bite can mutate a human, but Eddie did in fact have what looked to be a pretty nasty bite on his right shoulder. The doctor said it appeared to be a dog bite, and it was super infected. Rabies weren't really an issue in our neck of the woods, but Eddie was still quarantined, and we steered clear of stray dogs for a while after the whole ordeal. Eddie never recovered mentally. Not that he was stable to begin with. He was constantly trying to tear off his own skin and bite the necks of those who tried to help. Luckily, no one was seriously injured by him. But most sadly, Eddie ultimately ended up taking his own life two years later. He slit his wrists with a sterling silver knife that his mother had gotten him from her shaman. They believed that it was the only way to rid him of the beast that possessed him. When I was about 16, my cousins Lena and Vincent were visiting from New Mexico. They are both a few years older than me, but we got along really well. I'm the youngest of all the grandkids on Katie's side, and the only grandkid on Arga's, so I always looked forward to seeing these two. They were staying with us a few days over the summer. They were both in college by that point, and they wanted to have some time away from the heat before they went back to their rigorous schedules. Their dad, Katie's brother Max, was there as well. He was a paleontologist, and was intending to do some digging in the tundra while he was there. Around the second week of their stay, Katie and Gloria went with Max to his site, leaving Arga to entertain us young'uns. She was feeling a bit under the weather, so she requested that the three of us go out and do some of the maintenance she had been working on in the cemetery. Weeds aren't much of an issue here, but grass, flowers and other plants die when the weather is so inconsistent. Every June and July, we would go to all of the grave sites and clean them up. I'd been relieved of my duties because my cousins were in town, but Arga didn't want it getting backed up. Plus, she'd promised to drive us into the city to next day, and treat us to dinner and a movie if we helped. Vincent was surprisingly squeamish about the cemetery. He kept asking me why the tombs were so easy to open, and freaking out about the possibility of something jumping out at him. It got to the point where Lena and I couldn't take it anymore, and asked him to go sit on one of the concrete benches that lined the fence. As he was going over, he let out a groan and covered his nose. What the hell is that smell? He shouted. There was an unspoken rule in my family, that we were to never speak of hell or demons within the gates of the cemetery. So I immediately shushed my cousin, and asked him to say a prayer aloud to ask for forgiveness. But he ignored me, and pointed at one of the tombs. Why is that one broken? He demanded. I went over to see what he was talking about, and was startled to realize that one of our newer tombs, the one belonging to the village shaman's late mother, had a large crack down the middle. It looked like it had been sloppily broken and reassembled, 
the intense smell coming from it suggested the body was well into the decomposition process. For some idiotic reason, I pulled my shirt over my nose and crouched down to further inspect the grave. I shifted some of the smaller pieces of stone to the side and peered into the hole I'd made. Of course, the first thing I saw was the old woman's rotten hand. She had died two months before at the age of 102, and her skin had been like tissue paper. So her bones were already visible beneath the remaining tissue. The rest of the body was connected, and everything that had been buried seemed to be there. When the initial shock from seeing a deteriorated corpse wore off, I did notice something rather shocking. The body was positioned with the head towards north. In Inuit culture, only men are buried with their heads facing north. Females were buried facing the south, because they got cold easily. We never would have mixed this up, and even if we had, many people would come to view the body for days before it was finally laid to rest. Someone would have said something, that she had been positioned wrong. This revelation is what truly sent me into panic mode. Someone came in and not only desecrated a grave, which is twisted no matter which culture or belief system you're from, but they also rearranged the body in a way that could affect their spirit negatively. This woman could now be suffering in the land of souls. I ran inside without a word to my cousin. Arga knew what to do about this. She used to tell me stories of grave robbers from her childhood. These were fishermen from a town over, and their goal was to steal the jewellery and pelts our dead had been buried in. When I finally woke my mother from her NyQuil coma, she pulled on her jacket and followed me outside to the vandalised grave. Vincent was standing just outside of the cemetery now, his face white as a sheet. He obviously hadn't told Lena about our discovery, because she was on the other side of the yard plucking dead flowers out of the ground. Argy yelled at her to come and take her brother inside. When Lena waltzed over to us, she noticed Vincent was shaking and taunted him in a high-pitched voice. Ooh, little buddy, did you see a ghost? Arga shoved him towards the house and demanded that he pray for forgiveness. She then asked Lena to call the police in the next city over. Matters such as this had to be dealt with by a higher authority than the ones our town had to offer. Surprisingly, Arga allowed me to stay behind and help her examine it. I chalked this up to her being drunk on NyQuil. She was just stunned with the state of the grave and the body inside. Her experience prior to this had been in greedy white men who wanted quality ivory and labradite jewellery. For some reason, that was easier to accept than someone deliberately dooming the spirits of those who were laid to rest. The police came along with the shaman of the next village over. The one in our town was unable to perform a proper ceremony due to his relationship with the deceased. We have all been assured the woman's spirit is at peace now. There were no suspects as to who desecrated the grave, and it never happened again. So the police didn't really follow up with us after that. As you can imagine, my cousins refused to go into the cemetery after that. As you surely now know, I was generally restricted from going into the cemetery by myself when I was younger, up until I was about 11 or 12. That's when I was glued to my parents' sides when we walked to the property. My Uncle Cal used to be the top candidate as my chaperone when neither of my mothers were available. He's a pretty solid dude, and he's willing to knock out anyone who poses a threat to me or anyone else in my family. One morning, when I was six years old, my mothers needed to be at the school to discuss an upcoming festival. Cal wasn't what you would consider a natural when it came to kids. He was so nice, and did his very best when he was left to care for me, 
but he never really mastered the art of talking or playing with me. For example, on this particular day, he decided to play hide and seek. This wasn't anything new to me. I'd played all the time with my mums and aunts, but they always knew to go over the rules very carefully before we'd play. Stay in the yard. Don't go into the cemetery. Don't hide in any holes or dens made by animals. And always come out of your hiding spot when the seeker yelled, Ali Ali Oxen Free. Uncle Cow didn't know about these rules, and I wasn't about to remind him. I wanted to find a new hiding spot. If I had to crouch down inside one of the chicken coops one more time, I was going to scream. Cal hated to hide, so he volunteered to seek every time for the game. This was an added bonus. When I played with my parents and their sisters, I had to be the seeker all the time. I was slow, and they were competitive, so they didn't hold back when they got a chance to tag me. You have to count to a hundred, I informed my uncle, as I led him to the shed that would be my home base. And you can't peek. He nodded along and turned to face the wall of the shed. I was running before he even began to count. I wasn't going to hide behind a gravestone or mausoleum. Even at a young age, I knew how disrespectful that would be. But there was a patch of trees in the centre of the yard that were calling me. I discovered it a few weeks ago, that one of the trees, an aspen tree, had a low hanging branch that I could climb if I got a running start. Kids climbed one similar to it in the play area at school. I had joined in with them once, but my aunt Gloria who taught me at school with my mum, Katie, was on playground duty that day, and she immediately made me get down. Without an adult to tell me no, and with at least 60 seconds left, I sprinted through the cemetery towards my goal. The tree that I have since named Yulei, after the Edgar Allan Poe poem, welcomed me with yellowing leaves and white branches, hanging down like arms stretched out for a hug. I didn't hesitate. In fact, I picked up speed and lunged as soon as I was within reach. With what I can only call pure luck, I was able to grab onto the lowest branch and pull myself up on the first try. I was only five or so feet off the ground, but I felt as though I had climbed the Denali Peak. Knowing that I could still be seen in my bright blue jacket, I scrambled up a few more branches and positioned myself behind a large cluster of leaves that had yet to fall. By the time I was fully situated, Cal was done counting and had been moving about the yard for a few minutes. He checked in the usual places a six-year-old may have hidden. Most of them were places that I had frequented in hide and seek of days past, and a few places he looked were ones I had never thought of, but catalogued in my brain for the next time I played. I could see him quite easily from my little perch, and I was able to laugh at him without fear of being heard, because he was nowhere near me. He was scratching his head, and double checking everywhere he'd previously looked before, and then went into the house to search. At this point I was getting sore, and leaned back against the trunk of the tree and waited for him to come out. The air was quiet, and I could hear the chirps of some birds nesting in the surrounding trees. If I hadn't been sitting on a narrow branch, sitting 20 feet above the ground, I would have allowed myself to drift off. But I stayed alert, hoping to see my uncle reappear soon. It was then that I felt a tingly feeling on the back of my neck. It wasn't unlike the sensation I got when my mums ran their finger through my hair or rubbed my back. Feeling relaxed, I glanced around 
and noticed just how still it was in this little oasis centered in the aunt's cemetery. At this point, I was feeling rather euphoric. It wasn't until I was older that I found something that simulated a similar feeling. I wanted to find my mums. I had this overwhelming need to tell them that I loved them and give them a hug. I felt guilty for going into the cemetery and breaking their rules. I quickly began to climb out of the tree and in the process ended up missing a branch and fell about eight feet to the ground. Later on, I would learn that I broke my wrist and thumb when I landed, but somehow didn't feel the pain and just had to return to my parents. In my delusional state, I decided the best route to take to get to town was through the woods behind the cemetery, probably because I was closer to the woods than I was to the road, but the forest was thick full of traps that had been set by hunters and forgotten about. It was another place that I was told to avoid. Luckily, I didn't run into any traps that day. There was a pretty clear path that had been made by my mother, Arga, and her siblings back when they were young. So I stuck with that. That's when things got hazy. At some point, the euphoric sensation turned into one of dread. I began to feel as though someone or something was chasing me. I remember crying and calling out for Cal to come and find me. And eventually, I blacked out. When I awoke, I was lying in a pile of leaves and staring up at the night sky. Pain flaring up in my right arm and my feet stung. Climbing to my feet, I looked around and realized I was still in the woods. It took me a moment to get my bearings, but as soon as I figured out where I was, I was only a few feet from the path and headed in the direction of the cemetery. My jacket was gone, as were my shoes and socks. I don't know what the hell happened there. My tiny feet were freezing and stung against the rocky ground. When I emerged from the forest in the cemetery, I could see red lights flashing up by the house, and I immediately knew who they were for. For a moment, I contemplated turning back and living my life in the woods, but I soldiered on. And by the time I was halfway across the graveyard, I could hear someone shouting my name. It was my mother, Katie. She was the strict one with an Irish temper and a hand made for spanking. When I saw her running through the cemetery gate, I immediately felt a rush of relief. I couldn't run. I was too sore and I could only hold up my left arm, but I called out to her as hot tears steamed down my cheeks. She picked me up, hugged me close, and didn't yell at me for wandering off, nor did she scold me for not wearing coat nor shoes. She just asked me if I was all right and told me she loved me. Even then, when adrenaline was coursing through my veins, I was relieved that she was taking pity on me. I was way too drained to get a spanking. Katie took me to the house where a hysterical Arga was waiting with her sisters and my aunt Gloria. I didn't get to stay home though. Once they realized I had been injured out in the woods for nearly 12 hours, I was placed in the waiting ambulance and rushed to the next town for medical care. I was released the next day with a bright pink cast and ordered to stay inside for at least 72 hours. The shaman visited us the next day. He was summoned by my grandfather after I told him about what led me into the woods. My parents stayed with me as I described the ordeal to the shaman. I told him about how happy I felt and about how I longed to be with my parents so much, I went into the woods that I feared more than any grave and mausoleum. After that was said and done, the shaman went out to the path of trees I had been hiding in and began to bless them and burge sage and incense. He told my mothers that I could have been influenced by his spirit, but he said that it was likely a young child had passed and missed their parents.
Katie, who wasn't as superstitious as her wife, was skeptical of this explanation. She believed in spirits and all, but she didn't think they had the power to control living beings. But she didn't have a reasonable explanation as to why her six-year-old wandered into the woods and blacked out. So they allowed the shaman to go through with his rituals and reinforce their rule that I wasn't allowed to go into the cemetery alone. Uncle Cal, who had been royally terrified after the ordeal, was the only one to yell at me. I was surprised. He was always a pretty chill guy, and he never really got onto me before. But he had been terrified that he'd lost me forever. And when he found out that it was all because I had broken a rule that I was very familiar with, he blew his top. This was one of the many experiences that occurred in my childhood. I wish I knew more about what caused it, but even my tribe's leader have no explanation. They just used it as an excuse to warn children to not wander about on hallowed land. This is from when my parents first began living together. Katie grew up in a fairly large city, just a few hours from our village. Her mother was a nurse, who occasionally brought medical supplies to the more remote areas of the state, and provided vaccines for those who wanted them. They met Aga and her family, when they were about nine or ten. They were all friends, and Grandma Mary would sometimes leave Katie and her twin sister Gloria there overnight, while she visited other villages. When they reached their teens, Katie and Aga began secretly dating, and eventually they broke the news to their families. Grandma Mary was a devout Catholic, and took it surprisingly well. Poor poor and Ma Aga's parents were a bit unnerved by the whole thing. They had never really dealt with homosexuality within their tribe, and they were convinced that their ancestors would strike them down if they allowed the two girls to continue their courtship. When the community and council members voted on it though, they all agreed, so long as Aga and her family maintained their faith, and upheld the customs of their people, no harm would come to them from the union. Once they had the blessing from both women's families, they were allowed to move in together. They were barely 17 at the time, but that's how it was within our village. There was no ceremonies, they just went from living apart to living together. This represented betrothal. The house they moved into was small, and only about a half mile away from the main house, where we eventually moved. But at the time, it was Papa and Moore's house. Katie and Aga swear that the shack was once a charming little cottage, with a beautiful red door and matching shutters. But all I know is that it's currently a condemned structure, that gives me splinters just looking at it. Aga worked with her father on most weekdays. Her older brother was a fisherman, and he had no interest in the family business. So my mother was next in line to inherit. She loved the cemetery and the funeral home, because she felt that she enjoyed providing a place for closure to those who were going through the most challenging times in their lives. Sometimes she worked long hours, so Katie would spend most of her time in the town teaching, or at the house cleaning or cooking. At the time, she wasn't too put off with the cemetery in her backyard. It was a peaceful place, and she never gave it a second thought. One afternoon, she was outside cleaning the windows. She had music playing from the radio inside, so she didn't hear the truck approaching on the dirt path until it was right behind her. She didn't recognize that it was one of Arga's family members' vehicles, so she immediately stopped what she was doing, so that she could welcome the stranger she was a debutante, and hospitality was very important. The man who stepped out the truck was white, which wasn't odd there, 
There were a few families in the valley, and even some Russians. They rarely made it to this part of the property though. The main house was where the funeral home was, and all business was performed up there. Thinking that he may have been lost, Katie waved at the gentleman, who had to have been in his late 30s to early 40s. He was handsome, with an almost rugged look to him. Overall, he seemed very approachable. The only thing that seemed off about him was his lack of jacket. He was only wearing a flannel shirt and blue jeans. It was 30 degrees out in our town in this part of the country, where it can sometimes be dark all day. This was one of those times, with no sun and a substantial amount of wind, it was foolish to go outside without some sort of coat. Katie was only out there because the windows were driving her nuts. How can I help you? She asked him as he meandered towards the porch. Do you have a dog? The guy seemed out of breath as he looked about the property, as though he were looking for something. No, no dog, Katie told him. The stranger pointed to the wooded area on the east side of the property. There's a dog stuck in a trap just off the path over there. Do you know whose it might be? It's brown with a black muzzle. Immediately, Katie stepped off the porch and looked towards the trees. I have no idea. Could you not get it out of the trap? She was, and still is, a sucker for animals. She has a habit of bringing home strays and injured wildlife to this day. I don't have any tools with me. The gentleman pointed to his trunk. Do you have a crowbar or even a screwdriver? I can probably take the trap apart if you don't mind keeping the thing calm while I do it. It didn't occur to Katie that it would probably have been better to get someone stronger to assist him than zeroing in on a petite woman who could barely reach the top of her windows. It also didn't occur to her that the man had driven from a different part of the property, and that he would have come from the other side of the house if he was coming from the woods. All she knew was that a dog was hurt, and that she wanted to help it. She ran into the house and dug through the chest, where they kept all the tools that Arga's brother had given them when they moved in. She found the tools he requested, as well as some flashlights, and followed him to his truck. She had not yet been jaded by a world filled with criminals and pervs, so she didn't think twice about going off with a fellow Good Samaritan. The man drove fast, and when they got close to the edge of the forest, he drove off the path to get a shortcut that most of the hunters in the area used. It dawned on Katie that the man didn't have a gum rack in the cab of his truck, and that he was hardly dressed for a hunting trip. She glanced at the floor behind her seat, searching for a coat or some kind of jumper that he may have changed out of, but she didn't see anything of the sort. When the truck stopped, she asked him about his attire. She suggested that they go to her brother-in-law's cabin to get a coat, and he immediately refused. My jacket is with the dog, he explained, motioning for her to follow him up the path. The poor thing looked cold, and I wanted him to be at least a little comfortable as he waited for me. This eased Katie's nerves. He's a nice guy, taking care of a dog. They walked up the path that Katie had only ever been on once or twice before. As kids, they explored the woods, but they never went into this area for fear of being shot. With no daylight, they would at least be safe from hunters. But there were still other elements to worry about, like bears and foxes. The man led the way, shining the flashlight over the path to make sure they were going the right way. They walked for nearly a half hour, before Katie stopped and took in the surroundings. She asked if they were getting close to the dog, and the gentleman nodded. It's near the pass up ahead. He's sort of off the path. 
so keep an ear out. He turned and gave her a smile that even today she calls charming in a Ted Bundy kind of way. As though he sensed her discomfort, the guy started a little dialogue with her. I'm Aaron, by the way. I live out by the border. You from round these parts? Confused, Katie bit back the urge to throw a no shit at him. He had just taken her from her house. What did he think? Was she a tourist who cleaned windows for giggles? Rather than be rude, she primly hummed an affirmative while shining her flashlight right and left looking for the dog. Are you married? Aaron went on. While Katie asked him what brought him to the conclusion, he reminded her that she'd mentioned a brother-in-law. Is your husband not home? Wife, actually, Katie corrected. She's down the road. She'll be home soon. She felt that it was important to add that, even though it wasn't true, Aga wasn't expected home for another few hours, actually. But she wanted to make the guy know that she might have had people looking for her soon. Aaron was quiet for a few seconds. They'd reached a rocky incline on the trail, and he seemed to be focusing on that. Once the silence began to settle, he let out a chuckle. That's pretty hot. Two women in all. While grateful that he wasn't like a lot of people when they first found out about their relationship, rude, and disgusted, Katie almost always found his reaction even worse. For the sake of remaining polite, she faked a laugh. Ah, sure. So, how do you, you know? He stopped walking and turned to face her. Katie really hoped that he wasn't talking about what she thought he was talking about. How do we do what? You know, screw, he clarified with a casual shrug. Disgusted, Katie stepped back. That's none of your business. She tried to remain calm, but the man's sudden change in attitude had her on edge. Can we please just get the dog? Oh, oh yeah. Aaron looked around, as though he forgot why they were there in the first place. He laughed sheepishly and shook his head. I'm so sorry, ma'am, but there's no dog. I just brought you out here for a good time. His cavalier attitude gave Katie pause. She let his words sink in for a second, figuring that she had to have misheard. But when he began to unzip his pants, she knew that she had heard right. In Katie's retelling of the event, some small details change here and there, but one thing was always constant in her response at that exact moment of realization. Shit. She didn't give him a chance before slamming her flashlight repeatedly into his head, throat, and chest. She basically hit him as many times as she could until he fell to the ground. When she knew he was unconscious, she turned on heel and ran back the way they came. She didn't know exactly where she was, but she figured that if she stayed on the path, that she would eventually find her way. And she was right. She saw the truck at the edge of the field, right at the opening of the path. She checked the vehicle and was relieved to see that he'd left the keys in the ignition. She drove it across the field towards the main house where she found Pawpaw, Arga, and Arga's brother, Cal. The three of them were horrified when they heard her account of what had just happened, and the men immediately went into the woods to find the injured man. Meanwhile, Arga called the authorities, aka Jimmy, the town-appointed sheriff, with a collection of European muskets and three dogs that could tear the skin off a man's bone if ordered to. Jimmy arrived, as Paw Paw and Cal were returning, with the latter pulling Aaron by the foot through the mud. He was taken to a jail, aka the concrete cell off Jimmy's house, 
where he remained until the police from a nearby city came to collect him and perform an official investigation. As it turns out, Aaron was a fisherman from the coast and he visited friends in our area once or twice a year. He had tagged along with some of these friends when they were visiting Cal at the funeral home. And at some point, it was innocently mentioned that Katie was at the house and that she was home alone or something like that. When he found himself with some alone time, Aaron borrowed a truck and found the house and the beautiful Katie alone as promised. They never really got an answer as to why he thought it was okay to take a woman into the woods for nefarious reasons. He was a relatively attractive guy, and he seemed normal for the most part. In the end, he got a little bit of prison time, and he was banned from our village. That was the most they could do, really, given that he actually didn't do anything to Katie. After all, he was the one who came out with most of the injuries. That's one of the rare occasions that something scary happened on our property that didn't involve the cemetery or funeral home. But it was definitely the first time one of my mothers came face to face with the true evils of the world. I come from a military family, and as such, I lived all over the country often unable to keep friends for any period. I also have insane social anxiety, so I'm overall pretty bad at making friends to begin with. This story starts after I lived in rural Newfoundland for about three years, at age 14. I have no friends. My home life is pretty terrible, and I was at this point pretty depressed. I lived on about an acre of land, with a river separating us from about a million acres of raw forest that had a bunch of ATV trails in it. It was a spooky forest, and I have tons of stories about what I saw in there that makes most horror movies look like a joke. Of note is the Bear Trap Forest the 40-foot swamp, the random abandoned suburb, and the house in the middle of nowhere. But these are tales for another time. It was around late August. My parents had told me for many weeks now there had been hoots and hollers coming from our backyard. They had seen flashlights and thought it was just some kids trying to break into our garage and steal some beer. There had been times, and I'd heard it too, normally in the evening, of just a couple of voices periodically hollering, and often I heard several voices speaking from just across the river in the woods. No big deal. A lot of kids hung out in those woods, and due to my oppressive social anxiety, I sure as hell didn't have any desire to talk to them. After this happened for some weeks, I heard the kids doing their usual thing around four in the afternoon and decided, you know what? I'm going to see what's so amusing. So I ventured into the woods and go maybe about 300 feet and an ATV trail my neighbor used. And I met one of them. I'm going to use their names as it will give some context. The kid I met was called Jack. He was a year or two younger than me, about a foot shorter and wearing some really out of date clothes. He seemed kind of surprised to meet me, but we said our hellos. I said I had heard them for a while now, and came to see what was happening. Jack got super pumped, and insisted I follow him to his friend's project. So I followed the guy, and I'm taken into an area that is pretty clear cut in a dense path of woods. I knew this area. I hung out in the woods alone a lot and explored, and this was brand new. There were two other kids there, one my age named Elvis, 
and another older kid by about two years called Louis. They said they were working on a treehouse slash fort and wondered if I would be interested in helping. I of course said yes. I had never been asked to hang out with anyone and they showed me around. Now, I need to discuss these kids clothes. When I say out of style, I'm talking early 80s miserable fashion. Neon colors, one kid had shoulder pads, and was a mess. They wore big rubber boots, and the kids looked, I want to say, new, like they had no signs of pimples, their hair was immaculate, their clothes crisp as hell. I had just assumed they were hand-me-downs from their parents or something, as they stated that they were all friends, not brothers. So these kids were nice to me, and I mean really nice. I never really got to know them, they never wanted to talk about their home life, but that isn't surprising where I lived. We used hatchets, saws, ropes and nails to make a pretty solid fort, had about 8 foot walls made of birch trees, and we made a table to sit at. A lookout post in the biggest tree that we could find. The place was about the size of a one bedroom apartment, and we were all pretty proud. One day, we were sitting at the table, talking about our favourite trees or something, and I asked Elvis why I'd never seen him around before. If he lived near me, he had to go to my school. It was one of two schools in the town, and no way he lived in the catchment area of the other one. He insisted he did, and wondered why he'd never met me either. We didn't know the same classmates, same people, and could barely agree on teachers. But whatever. These kids talked to me, and that was enough. So about two weeks after meeting them and building this fort, on one of these days, I said I needed to go home and get something to eat. I asked if they wanted something too, as this was basically my backyard, and my parents always made way too much food. They became downright hostile. Not over the food, they just refused to cross the river, adamantly. Louis came up with the story about how crossing a stranger's river is bad luck but I sure wasn't pushing the issue. I asked if they wanted something, and they said yes, and I brought back a pie that we could all eat. They apologised about getting angry, said they were just very superstitious, and I thought nothing more of it. We had a good rest of the day planning to invade the woods looking for some thick pine trees. Cut to about a week later. I had went to the fort, and we did our thing. But today the kids looked haggard. Jack was particularly bad. He looked like he had just gotten the beat down of his life while catching pneumonia three times over. I asked if he was okay. He said he just had flu. But they also looked wet, maybe greasy is a better word. They had sick hair. Their skin was all shiny and clammy, and their clothes looked like arse. I wasn't shocked. These kids wore the same clothes pretty much every day, but so did a lot of the really poor kids in town. We played around for an hour or so before they left, with Louis saying he would see me tomorrow, as Jack and Elvis walked away coughing like they'd smoked a pack a day. I had told my parents about these kids. They thought they were weird, but a kid with no friend just found three, so don't ask questions. The nighttime hollering had stopped at this point, and we never did see the flashlights again. So the next day I went back with a hatchet, a bag of nails in hand, as the plan was that we were going to give the lookout a roof. When I come to the fort, the place is wrecked. The walls had been torn down. The table was in half, and the lookout had maybe one or two pieces left to it. Most notably, everything was rotting, like it had been sitting there for decades, rotting. The table was basically nothing. 
and I could see growth in what had been our floor. Solid, half-tree growth. My only thought was, what the hell? And I rationalized that maybe someone found out about the fort and wrecked it. So I waited for the kids to come. Next day, and the next day, and the day after that. I waited a week, but never did see those kids again. I was pretty dejected, and eventually I stopped trying to wait for them. I wanted to look for them, but they had never shown me or told me where they lived, other than up the hill. My parents noticed and asked me why I wasn't hanging out with the kids anymore. I told them what was happening, and they dismissed it and just insisted that they probably didn't want to be my friend, that I didn't need them. I was sad for a good while after that. Cut to today, I'm 29, and telling my wife about these kids I used to hang out with. And this time, we made a call forward. I explain how they look, how they acted, and it's overall a pretty good memory with a sad ending. My wife looks at me wide-eyed and said, you hang out with a bunch of spooky ghost kids. I find this crazy, but she says, did anyone else see them? And no, they didn't. They saw a flashlight, but not the kids. They heard them and they heard about them, but no one had ever laid an eye on them other than me. There were never any records I could find about them. No one else in the school they supposedly went to knew them, and they never showed me their house or came to mind despite my insistence. My wife said it was some spooky stuff, and that I should probably share it with all of you. What do you guys think? Last year, my family and our friends reserved two houses for us to celebrate the New Year's Eve on. One house was for me and my parents, and the other one was for our friends. As we arrived and greeted each other, we sat around this big table and started talking and playing tabletop games. We were all in the first house at this point, and as you can imagine, I was pretty bored after a while, so I began playing on my phone. But my battery eventually started to drain, so I wanted to grab my charger from my room in the second house. I grabbed the keys, went to go outside, and opened the second door and put the key in the closest corner of the table. I intentionally put them there, so that as I'm unpacking my stuff, I don't lose them somehow. You know how it goes with your keys or your phone. It's super easy to lose them, and then they're nowhere to be found. Anyway, back to the story. I had to be careful, since we only had one key per house, and after I left the key on the table, I went up to my room and grabbed the charger. It took me about two to three minutes, and as I went downstairs, the keys were gone. I instantly froze, and shivers went down my spine. My hair stood up, and tears were pushed into my eyes. I was freaked the hell out. Adrenaline flooded my body, and I gained courage, clenched my fists, and started screaming. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. I don't know if you get that feeling when you're scared and brave at the same time. I looked around, and saw the keys were now on the kitchen counter, four meters away from the spot I had put them on. I knew that it wasn't much that could happen, and I'm not the type that suffers short-term memory loss. But in any case, I grabbed them and ran. I was 10 or 11 years old, and was sleeping in my grandma's guest bedroom. Next to the bed was an antique easy chair. When I woke up next morning, I looked over towards the chair, and sitting there was a little girl. She had dark hair that was done up in pigtails and tied by a blue ribbon. She wore an old-fashioned dress of the early 1900s, and initially, I was startled to see her. I was even more startled to see through her. She just looked at me and smiled. She did a small wave and mouthed the words, Hello. I said hello back, 
and she faded. That was my first experience with a ghost. Months later, it was Easter Sunday. My sister and I were staying the night at my grandma's house so that we could receive our Easter basket and hunt for eggs. I woke up early to get a peek at the Easter baskets. I slipped out of bed and walked quietly to the living room. The early morning sunshine was brightly streaming through the windows and into the living room. Sitting on the couch was the little girl. I smiled and waved hello again, and she smiled and waved back. I told her it was great to see her, and she emphatically nodded that it was good to see me too. My grandma must have heard me talking to someone because she woke up and told me to go back to bed, that it was still far too early to hunt for eggs. I looked at my grandmother and then back at the couch. The little girl was gone. That was the last time I saw the little girl with the blue ribbons in her hair. My grandma moved from there shortly after into a new place. However, my friend Melissa ended up moving into where my grandma lived, and she claims to have seen the little girl with the ribbons in her hair. During the same period, my mom's sister and I were all living in a trailer on my great uncle Wilbert's property, a large cattle ranch. We were staying there while my dad was stationed in Okinawa, Japan. On this property in the mid 80s, Uncle Wilbert had built a two story building. Everybody called it the tower. Windows faced each direction on the top floor, the largest one faced towards Highway 99. Wilbert believed that you could learn much from observing the 99. In the evening, he would often go up to the tower, watch TV, and keep watch over the cattle. In the lower portion of the tower is where my family kept our clothes and food. One night, Mum had instructed my sister and I to go to the bottom of the tower to pick out our breakfast for the next morning. Trisha was in the middle of doing something, so I offered to grab breakfast for her. I entered the bottom floor of the tower, chose a handful of Pop-Tarts, and above me I could hear the TV. So I assumed Uncle Wilbert was up in the tower. I stepped out the bottom half and looked up towards the large window to see if Wilbert was there. The TV was, but Wilbert wasn't in the tower. Instead, there was a family. A mother, father, little girl and boy. I thought that it was strange they were up there as Wilbert hardly ever had visitors. Another strange thing was that they weren't watching a TV. Instead, they were sitting on the couch and staring out the window towards Highway 99. They didn't move. They were all sitting with perfect posture and hands settled on their laps. Even though I thought it was unusual, I just returned to the trailer and didn't say anything to my mum about it. The next day, I asked Uncle Wilbert who his guests were, and he looks at me with a confused look on his face. He hadn't had any guests last night, and nobody by that description. Who were those people? A few months after that, I had gone down to the bottom of the tower again to grab my breakfast for the next morning. I went in, grabbed some oatmeal, and as I was closing the door behind me, I looked up to the landing that leads to the door on the top floor. Looking over the landing was a woman dressed in a white flowing dress. She herself was as white as the dress, and the woman's hair and dress blew in a non-existent wind. She looked down at me. She smiled, did a slow, long, graceful wave, and despite this friendly gesture, I was terrified. She reminded me of the depiction of banshees that I had seen in movies. I ran back to the trailer and told my mum about what I'd seen. She exited the trailer and took the stairs up to the top of the tower. She opened the tower door and no one was there. We knew the lady couldn't have gotten down the stairs because the windows on the trailer faced directly towards the stairway and we didn't see anyone come down. Most of the friends of the family know that the tower is haunted. 
I believe that it sits on some kind of vortex. Though my family no longer lives on the property, I still see spirits from time to time. I call them my visitors. I don't try and communicate with them, nor they me. They just appear. And as quickly as they come, they are gone. So my story begins in the sticks of Missouri, at an old campsite. For a few years, everyone on my mum's side of the family would meet and stay at this campsite owned by a family friend. It lies on the Mississippi and is miles away from any town. It's about 20 acres overall of mostly cleared land, but with woods lining the perimeter and has a pool cafeteria, mess hall, gymnasium, and about 10 cabins. It sits next to an old plantation house that was turned into a stop on the Underground Railroad, as it has a secret room behind the fireplace that held people. Anyway, my mother, her siblings, and my grandmother all went to camp there when they were about 10 to 13 years old. So this place is at least 90 years old. There are signatures all over the cabin interior from past campers, dating back from the early 20th century, and perhaps earlier, until present. The aunts and female cousins, myself included, stayed in one cabin, while the men stayed in another. And my brother and one cousin decided to be bold and stay in the one up the hill by themselves. Needless to say, they didn't get much sleep that night, and were pretty creeped out by the next day. But this isn't their story. On my side of the room, we had pushed the beds together, three of them, to make some sort of giant combo bed. I was on the bottom of a bunk bed at the edge of a combo bed furthest from the half-screened wooden door, and my cousin Allison was on the top bunk, and two other cousins were to my right, in the other beds. So after the last day, we were winding down from all the activities and fun, and were telling stories, until eventually we drifted off to sleep one by one. A few hours later, I woke, for no apparent reason. But when I looked towards the screen, I saw blonde slash whitish hair, bouncing about outside. I didn't think much of it, because my cousin, who was with my brother, had a big blonde afro at the time. I figured they were just messing around and went back to sleep. A bit later, I awoke again and saw a complete apparition of a woman standing in the center of the cabin, rapidly surveying the room. She was almost completely opaque, I'd say about 85%, and was dressed in 19th century working class garb apron, long-sleeved dress, and wore a disheveled bun. She was looking around the room, to me, and seemed confused as to what we were all doing there. But I did not feel that she was a negative presence. At this point, I was still in a stupor for having been awoken in the middle of the night. So I grabbed my flashlight that was next to me, shined it on her and said, What? in a whispered yell. Had I been completely conscious, this probably wouldn't have happened, but I felt reflexive. When the light hit her, she vanished. When she vanished, I felt unable to comprehend what happened at this point in the night, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next morning, I had somewhat of a realization of what happened, but I didn't want to tell anyone out of fear of having it dismissed as nothing, and no one believing me. We were all getting ready for the day, and walking to the mess hall for lunch, when my cousin Allison asks me if I'd seen anything weird in the night. Shocked and relieved, I recount the story to her. Apparently, she had awoken just before me, and saw the woman in the room. Not knowing how to react, she slowly turned over and tried to fall asleep again. Moments later, she heard me click my flashlight and exclaim. She said she also didn't want to feel that she was a negative presence, 
and thought that she looked as though she was checking up on us, and making sure that everyone was okay. We recently went back over this story together, and it turns out we've both experienced unexplainable things throughout our lives. We've just never talked to it to anyone, because we assumed no one would understand or want to understand. She suggested we possessed some sort of sensitivity to these kind of energies, and since her realizing it in herself has honed her ability. I agree with her, and the fact that we were the only two to feel her and wake up seems significant. Anyway, we told the story to the rest of the family, and everyone was spooked. We haven't returned to the campsite since. I assume it's because everyone assumes no one would want to go again because of what happened. But, like Alison and I said, she wasn't malefic at all, and I would be happy to return. When I was growing up in the 60s on Long Island, I adored my Aunt Elizabeth. She's my dad's baby sister, 12 years younger and 17 years older than me. She was a flight attendant for a major carrier and lived in an apartment in the city with a classic Italian beauty, petite with beautiful olive skin, green eyes and jet black hair. She doted on me and I loved the pictures and gifts that she'd bring for me from other parts of the country, and sometimes even Europe. When I got older, my parents would let me go visit her apartment, where she and her equally gorgeous and glamorous friends would smoke cigarettes, drink cocktails and play records and talk about glamorous and adult things together. And I would feel sophisticated and cool merely by being in the room. One day, when she was 30, she was called in sick to work. Thinking she had the flu, it turned out to be meningitis, but she was dead within two days. What followed were the saddest events of my childhood. One of three times I saw my father cry, big, racking sobs was as he was dressing for the wake. I remember Aunt Elizabeth laid out at the wake, wearing her flight attendant uniform, still beautiful. I remember how soft and lovely the cream-coloured satin lining her casket felt. So many people came to her funeral, that people just spilled out on the sidewalk next to our little suburban Catholic church. Sunday dinners with my grandparents and aunts and uncles never felt the same. Ironically, this niece of a flight attendant from the golden age of air has always been terrified of air travel. I used to travel quite frequently for work, and on some long-haul flights I would be unable to cope without the help from a whole bottle of red wine in Ambien. A few months ago, I decided I want to drop that. It's not exactly healthy. So on my first flight across the country in a while, I took 10 milligrams of melatonin, sat in my seat anxiously, and tried to fall asleep. Eventually I did, and what followed were terrifying dreams. Of course, it would take place on the same flight, and of course the cabin pressure would drop, and of course the plane would be plummeting, and I was about to die crashing into a cornfield. As everyone panicked and screamed, I saw a flight attendant walking down the aisle to my seat, and it was my Aunt Elizabeth. She was walking calmly and intently with a little sly smile on her face, as if I were an old friend of hers who she hadn't seen in a long time. She was wearing the same flight attendant uniform she was buried in, but her legs and feet were bare. She came, looked at me, took my left hand in hers and said, It'll be okay, honey. It really will. Things can look bad, and sometimes it gets a little turbulent, but the pilot will write it. And then said, How are you? I sputtered out the first thing that came to mind if asked, what have you done with your life since age 13? I think I mentioned where I went to school 
and something about my first job, something about cell phones and how much she would have loved them. I said my dad had passed, but my mum and sister were doing fine. I talked about how ridiculous rents were in the city and about the changes that had happened to our hometown. As I was babbling, I noticed the plane returning to normal, the pressure coming back, people calming down, and the dream ended shortly before everything returned to normality. Aunt Elizabeth's hand on my shoulder. I woke up 30 minutes before landing. I was so stunned by this dream. I hadn't really thought about Aunt Elizabeth or about her in detail for years. I had a few minutes, so I called my mother and told her what happened. I mentioned that I thought it strange that in the dream she was barefoot while working on the plane. And my mother paused and said, Elizabeth was buried barefoot. Apparently, it's custom in the little corner of Sicily that my father's family comes from for women to be buried barefoot when laid to rest, and they'd adhere to it when burying Aunt Elizabeth and my grandmother many years later. I would not have known as the lower lid of her casket was closed during the wake. I'm not even religious, but that made me truly believe that my Aunt Elizabeth came to visit me and comfort me during a time of stress and fear, or something like her, a piece of her. It was wonderful and moving to realize this, like a warm blanket around me. I suddenly recalled memories of my aunt that I didn't even know I had. I was in tears in an airport bathroom. I've been through a lot in my life, some moves, unemployment, two divorces, losing a house, and getting one back, friends and family dying. But for a few moments in a dream, I got to see someone who I loved and who loved me when I was a little girl, excited for the big world ahead of her. I love you, Aunt Elizabeth. Visit again, anytime. Currently, my boys are eight and six. At the time, they were four and two. We had been living in a place for about five to six months, and my oldest, who isn't firing on any cylinders to be honest, kept walking to the corner, looking up and talking. He was still doing a lot of babbling until he was almost six, and then after a few times, he walked over, grabbed his younger brother by the hand, walked him to the corner, and he also looked up, started talking, and they were both smiling and giggling, like an adult was interacting with them. After my youngest's third trip over, I asked, what in the world are you two doing? Thinking it was some kind of game. My oldest giggled and said, I'm talking to grandpa. I'm confused. Baby, your grandpa lives in Nebraska. He's very far away. My child looks at me and replies, No, mummy. It's your grandpa. As I said, my oldest was still doing a lot of babbling. So for him to suddenly speak so clearly and in a complete coherent thought was very unnerving. I look at the corner. Both my boys are talking and showing toys up to the corner. I watch for a few minutes. This all happened over a grand total of about half hour. Babies, come watch your movie so mum can finish dinner, because little ones have zero logic. The younger one waddles over and sits down. The eldest picks up the toys that had accumulated in the corner and put them away and sat next to his brother. I start dinner and I keep looking at the corner. Shot in the dark. Thanks, Grandpa. The door in the corner fell open like someone walked through it, and there was a heightened feeling in the room afterwards. That night, I had a dream of my childhood home, and on the path back to the woods, there was a small building, granite like a mausoleum, but was little more than an awning 
one wall that held a door, four pillars, and a bench swing. I walked to it, and lit an incense and sat on the swing, and started rocking, staring at the ground. Then, there they were, those old ratty sneakers. My grandpa was sitting next to me with that smile, sitting on the swing. I just started talking, mostly about the boys. I told him I missed him so much that I named my oldest after him. He just sat and listened with that smile on his face. After a while, we both stood up. I hugged him and told him I hadn't told him everything yet. Then my name was called from somewhere. I looked around, didn't see anyone, but I looked back and he was gone. I yanked the door open, and it went into this vertical shaft, endless in both directions, completely lined with doors. I woke up crying amidst a panic attack. My grandfather died in about 05, my grandmother in 08, and my son was born in 2010, just one week shy of my grandfather's birthday, which happened to be the day the doctor scheduled me to originally be induced. In December of 2002, one of my best friends, Richard, was getting married. I had moved off the peninsula a few years before, and had never met her, but apparently they had been together a while. Against my advice, he had joined the Marines, and was marrying his girl before he shipped off to Iraq for his first tour. My other two best friends, Kyle and Westy, came back to our old hometown of Port Angeles for the wedding as well. We had a good time the night before the wedding, and woke up early to make the 50 mile drive to Forks for the ceremony at the courthouse. Things started out badly, as the tire on my car blew out early on the way there, and we were forced to make the rest of the trip on my spare driving under 20 miles an hour. We were almost late, but we made it, and they had a nice little ceremony before we went to the bride's grandmother's house for the reception. The festivities didn't end until well after dark. The drive back to Port Angeles was too risky to make with a spare tire. It was overcast, foggy, and pitch black. There were no street lamps on the highway between Forks and Pennsylvania. My car was small and black, and we had almost been hit by speeding cars in the daytime, so I wasn't going to be able to get back to Pennsylvania until I had a new tire, but there was nowhere left in Forks open to buy one at that time of night, so we were going to have to find somewhere to bed down until the morning. The bride asked if we could crash at her grandmother's, but the grandmother said that she was afraid of the things that we could do to her in the night. Obviously, she was out of her mind. It was way too cold to sleep in the car. I had spent too much money on the party the night before, being the best man and all, and we couldn't get the money together for a room. The bride suggested her other grandma's cabin. Her other grandma had passed away a few months ago, and the cabin she lived in, out towards La Push, was vacant. My friend Kyle inexplicably said, No way. I'm going to take the last bus back to Pennsylvania. I'll see you tomorrow. And walked out the door without another word. That should have been a big clue to me that something was wrong, but I was stuck because I wasn't going to abandon my car. I grabbed my things, and Richard and his new wife drove us to her dead grandma's cabin about 15 minutes outside of town. It was in the middle of nowhere, and although they called it a cabin, it was more of a two-story house. There was a lamp in the driveway, but other than that, everything was pitch black out. Richard and his bride let Westy and I inside and had a look around with us. Most of the furniture had already been removed by her family. There was a card table, and a few metal chairs in the kitchen, and a wardrobe 
still in the only bedroom. The wardrobe, however, was completely empty. Its contents were in a pile in the middle of the room, and formed a man-sized nest. My uncle uses this place as a hunting lodge sometimes. He's a bit crazy. He hasn't gotten over Grandma's death, she volunteered. If he finds you here, he'll be really mad, so you should probably hide if you hear him. But he leaves a lot of Pepsi and beer in the fridge, so you can help yourself. Westy and I felt exactly as you'd imagine we did. But at this point, it was either stay here in the cabin with heat, or try to sleep outside where it's below freezing. Richard and his wife went to go have their wedding night, while Westy and I tried to figure out exactly where we were going to hide, if said crazy uncle did come around. There was a set of retractable stairs going up to the attic, where we found a couple of dusty, stained single mattress covers, with old handmade quilts and the husk of a thousand dead insects. We decided it was best to retract the stairs and hide out in the attic for the night. Apparently the crazy uncle preferred to sleep in a pile of his dead mother's clothes. The kitchen was devoid of knives, but I found a wood splitting maul on the back porch which we kept upstairs with us just in case. In my backpack, I still had a couple of malt liquors left over from the night before. Without TV, or radio, or any other form of entertainment, Westy and I sat on the mattresses, drinking Mad Dog 2020, and talking about old times with all the trouble that Richard had gotten himself into this time. Without any clocks available, we lost track of time, and had a decent buzz going. What we heard sobered us up pretty quickly. We heard a noise that sounded like the doorknob downstairs being shaken violently. With wide eyes, we looked over at each other and listened carefully. The noise occurred a few more times, and I slowly moved to the window to try and quickly peek out to see if there was a car in the lamp-lit driveway. There was nothing. We sat silently for a while and heard nothing. We began to talk again, but once again, were interrupted by what sounded like the refrigerator slamming shut and chairs being moved across the floor. There were no voices. I grabbed them all and waited at the top of the still retracted stairs. As suddenly as the noise started, it stopped and we waited in silence but heard nothing. We were freaked out. We couldn't go to sleep, but we got bored and began talking again in a whisper. Without a clock or watch, I don't know how long after we heard the chairs move, but it was when the phone began to ring. We waited for the phone to stop ringing, or for somebody downstairs to answer it, but nothing happened. The ringing kept going. It kept ringing beyond what any normal person would wait for an answer. I figured the crazy uncle, if he was there, would have picked it up a long time ago. So, we were probably alone. The only person who knew we were here was Richard and his wife. With the number of rings, I assumed it was an emergency. I lowered the stairs and took them all with me just in case. I braced for an attack, but no one came. Nobody was waiting for me at the bottom of the stairs, and I could see the kitchen was clear. I walked over to the still ringing phone and picked it up. The ringing stopped, but there was no dial tone. The phone was dead. I picked up the phone and looked at it. It wasn't plugged into the wall. It was an old rotary phone with a mechanical belt that looked like it had been made back in the 60s. It sat there silent. I used the bathroom and went back upstairs and told Westy about the phone. He said I was messing with him, but I assured him I wasn't and told him to go and look for himself. 
Westy, suffice to say, was pretty freaked out. He needed to take a leak, but was too afraid to go downstairs. Instead, he peed out of the second floor window into the cold night air. The window stuck open, and it was freezing. I was freaked out and mad. The phone started ringing again. We sat and counted the rings. I remember counting as high as 170, when I decided it was useless. I wasn't going back downstairs to answer an unplugged phone. I lay down on the mattress, listening to the phone ring, and passed out. In the morning, Westy and I woke up early and freezing. We had no idea when Richard would be coming for us, but we decided we would search around for another phone. The night before, I had heard the unplugged phone ring right in front of me, but I was skeptical. We searched all over. There was only one phone on the property. It was the one sitting unplugged in the kitchen. I looked it over. There was nothing funny about it at all. No batteries, no dial tone, nothing. I've had plenty of weird and unexplainable experiences, but this one is the only one that I find difficult putting into words. When I was around six, I remember whenever I found myself alone, I used to see a man in my house always behind me, in corners, behind the sofa I was sitting on. This happened for years. This thing was very human-like. There was not a faded or blurred line, and this thing would always be wearing the same clothes when I saw it. I would catch glimpses of it, and as soon as I turned around, it would be gone, as if nothing were there. I remember as a child, it didn't scare me as much as it should have, but I was always super cautious and uneasy. It never made me run crying to my parents, though. What is weird is that at this time I recognised the man. In my head, the man was my uncle slash family friend, who I thought was very much alive. So everything I saw, I put down to my imagination. A few years go by and I kept on seeing this. What I realised was that I never saw this man in real life. There were no pictures of him, never any meeting with families, so how could I possibly have this feeling that I knew him? How could my brain invent this character and backstory for him? I was asking around for this unidentified uncle, and it seems he never really existed. I looked at the family photos of the family who I thought were his, and nothing. Unfortunately, my father passed a few years ago, and since I've been trying to find photos of him, I came across a photo of my dad and his dad, my grandfather, who I'd never met. And the man I used to see looks a lot like him, but not an 100% match. My memories have obviously faded because of how long ago it was, but I know it's only in resemblance, and not who I used to see as a child.